Hello. Hi, I'm just gonna give it another minute or two for people to join and then I'll kick off. Okay, Dave, are we all set to go? Yes, we're good to go. Okay, great. Uh, well, hello, I'm Tasha Elson. I'm the CEO at Finos. And I'd like to thank you all for joining us this morning at our first mini summit. I hope you've enjoyed the conference so far and that you find these next sessions interesting. Uh, in my next very brief 10 minutes, I'm going to give you a little bit of an introduction to Finos, as well as a very, very high level overview of the financial services market and why we think there's such a great opportunity for collaboration through open source in the industry. So as I mentioned, we're Finos, the FinTech Open Source Foundation, and we are the financial services vertical within the Linux Foundation. And our aim is to help the financial services industry leverage open source so uh, software, standards, services, and policies to solve industry challenges together um, and really to, to innovate as well. And we are a membership organization and our 36 members, both corporate and associate members, really do represent uh, the community and the different participants in the financial services industry. We have large technology, we have large banks, large investment banks and technology firms, both small and large, um, who really know financial services and open source. And we have associate members uh, who are um, nonprofits, other nonprofits, uh, government organizations, academic institutions, whose goals are, whose aims for the industry are aligned with ours. Um, we have 37 uh, active and incubating open source projects, standards, and special interest groups, which is uh, new for our foundation, and a growing number of contributors uh, focused on our, our Finos projects. So it's a little bit harder than you might think to actually define financial services. Um, it's a term that can be a little bit vague and, and quite encompassing for lots of different areas. Um, so I've broken it down here at a very, very high level into banking, investment management, and insurance. Um, insurance is sometimes included when people talk about financial services and sometimes not. It currently, it isn't one of our focus areas, although certainly a lot of our projects and the work that we do um, is applicable to that industry as well. But really our core focus um, since our inception, uh, at, at our inception was around uh, investment banking. But we, we certainly are seeing that broaden as we've come, become a more mature um, foundation. So in, in the examples that I give in, in the next few slides, I'm going to focus on investment banking, which is one part of banking. There's also retail banking, commercial banking, and, and in each one of these categories, you can drill deeper, deeper, deeper into specific areas and uh, services. Um, I'm going to focus on investment banking because that's my background. It's what I know. Um, and certainly we do have a lot of projects that have come from that area of the bank. Now, one other thing to mention before I move on is that this, this ecosystem gets very complicated. Um, different banks even will refer to these different areas with different terms and, and names. And they might cover parts of 
banking and parts of investment management. And, and really there can be a mix of the services that they provide to, to their end users. And within all of this, you have branches and subsidiaries and counterparties. Um, and so sometimes even doing something that seems quite simple, like a single view of uh, your client uh, can be complicated. And that can be complicated because you can have silos within, within the different areas. Um, and then even looking across areas, it's, um, it's a large amount of data to, to manage. Uh, which leads me to a little bit more about the volumes and the size and breadth of, of the industry. And again, it can be difficult to actually um, define the value of the global financial services market, but one report puts this value at $22 trillion. So that's pretty big. Uh, and a few more stats, ISDA, who you'll uh, hear about later, uh, puts the gross market value of OTC derivatives at $11.6 trillion. Um, the BIS, the Bank for International Settlements, reports that trading in FX markets in a single day last year reached $6.6 .6 trillion. That's in one day. And uh, also last year, the CBOE, the largest options exchange in the US, had an average um, of 7.2 million options, options contracts traded every day. So it's a, the, and this is just a few data points. You know, there are many, many more um, transactions and functions that happen, you know, including payments on, on, the, on the retail side, which really is a, a huge, huge market. And it's, it's a critically, it's critical financial infrastructure. You know, it's recognized by governments and policymakers as a fundamental part um, of our economy and, and keeping the nations running. So if we look at one of the biggest uh, players in this, in this financial services ecosystem, it's banks. And you know, they're it, just in the US, the European Union, and um, the UK, there are more than uh, 11,000 banks. And these banks, and I'm, I'm, I'm gonna use the term a little bit broadly because you can see that um, it actually, in the European Union, they refer to them as credit institutions, the PRA, I've taken the regulated banks, building societies and credit unions to, to put in that number. Um, and so those 11,000 banks employ more than 10 million people, again, just in those three markets, uh, although they are reasonably big markets. And then to bring it down to a, a slightly more specific sale, um, scale, something that, that may be a little bit easier to grasp, we can take the example of one large bank and it, and it, it does investment banking and corporate banking and, and retail banking as well. And they employ 250,000 people globally. Um, and 50,000 of those people in technology, and that technology division has a budget had a budget last year of almost 11 billion dollars. Um, so, although they're not technology companies, a little bit they're technology companies, um, and and they you know banks have always understood that technology is important, um, but with recent changes, there's certainly more that they have to do to take advantage of. Um, new technology and you can you know that's clearly recognized by by that level of budget so what are those 50,000 technology people in technology um, professionals in this one institution working on well quite a lot of things in in a bank you can have anywhere from four to seven thousand applications and, and those applications can be that, that are developed in-house, so there's a lot of proprietary software, um, or supported, maintained uh, vendor software. And, and actually, open source does underpin a lot of um, those processes and, that, and those applications as well. So in those you know, thousands of applications within a single organization, some of, the, some of those, those systems um, are meeting very specific business needs. Maybe it's for the FX trading desk or the salespeople or for IPOs, you know, there's really a very broad range. And then there's, of course, the, the levels um, just underneath that of legal and compliance, how you do your KYCs, your AML, your risk management, your financial control, your regulatory reporting. And then if, if you take it another step down, there's, there's common infrastructure that goes across the board too, and, and things that you might not think about. Um, the corporate real estate has apps, 
uh, software that they need to help manage the you know the buildings and and um, the spaces that the the bank uses. So there are really lots of different um, areas and functions that they serve. And I, I have to move along quickly now. Um, so what, what does this all mean? You have a big complex industry that provides essential services. You have hundreds of thousands of technologists working on lots of systems, many of which are solving the same business uh, and technical problems. And what that means is huge opportunities for open source collaboration. So you can see some of those uh, some of the ways that the financial services industry is collaborating in our landscape, which uh, shows you all of our different projects, standards, and SIGs. And today, you're going to get to hear about a few specific ones. Um, so that's what will be happening through the rest of the presentation. And at this point, I'll just hand over to my colleague, uh, James McLeod, who's our, the director of community. And he can talk a little bit about what some of the challenges are that that you have as you move from, you know, internal working internally in a team in a project to an open source environment. Um, so with that, James. So thank you very much, Tosha. Um, and thank you everybody for being here this afternoon um, at the Finos Mini, Mini Summit as part of OSSEU. I'm James McLeod, Director of Community. And this afternoon, I'm gonna take 20 minutes of your time to talk through the challenges, opportunities of building open source communities in a highly regulated financial services industry. So um, looking through the people who are actually here with, the, with us uh, this afternoon, I can see that you know, we have many engineers and we also have people who are very familiar with open source. Um, and so it's gonna be actually very easy to you know, communicate that we are living in a world, in an instant world, of open source technology, um, where there are products and solutions and ways and methodologies of working that um, you know, allow us to develop software very fast in a very agile and fast paced environment. However, within financial services, it hasn't always been like that. Um, so from my background um, as a financial services engineering lead, um, I know that there are many teams out there um, who have been uh, working in a very linear way. So, you know, following almost like um, an industrial revolution um, production line methodology of development. So taking your um, stories or your features and passing them down the production line um, all the way through to production, only to find that there's an issue there and then swinging um, that particular feature all the way back to the beginning. However, teams are actually moving forward from that now. And I'm really pleased that um, uh, digital transformation and you know, the move towards Agile and DevOps has actually taken us um, to a place where teams are actually moving more fast. You know, we've got um, feature teams within banks who are actually sharing you know, stories within their feature teams and working together to remove all of the blockers that slow us down um, from day to day. However, despite the fact that we are actually starting to deliver um, our features to our banking customers quicker, um, moving from you know, the corporate goals through the production team, so all of the agile ceremonies that we actually go through, um, all of the various different you know, DevOps methodologies that we go through, passing those containers through you know, test, UAT, and then live into production, we are still finding um, that there are engineering and team silos um, forming even around those um, processes which do speed that team up. Um, so even though you know, we're getting um, you know, prioritized features coming into teams, you know, and those same teams are actually um, fixing all of their defects and changes that are coming in from you know, product owners and other people. And quite often those teams are actually running the infrastructure you know, whether that's cloud or whether it's, you know, other form of mainframes, we're fine. You do actually find that those teams are still, you know, very much focused um, on their specific tasks and on their specific projects, um, which means that, um, you know, we still have duplication of effort running between teams. Um, we, although we're communicating very well within our teams, um, communicating outside of our teams can also be limited. 
Um, and quite often, you know, as we're looking at um, items to deliver to our customers, um, which are very feature and story driven, you know, sometimes we just want to get the job done. And so we go through um, a lot of, you know, reinventing and relearning the wheel. Now, from an industry um, point of view, um, if you take that on a global scale and then you multiply that across all of the various different financial services, you know, firms and, you know, companies that we have across the globe, all of those inefficient inefficiencies then get multiplied within all of the various different banks, whether it's retail, whether it's investment, you know, maybe even, you know, fintech um, firms are finding, you know, that they're creating inefficiencies as they start to get bigger. The, the problem of, you know, how we actually go from, you know, that linear um, process of de development into DevOps and then um, create even more inefficient, even more efficiencies out of um, inefficiencies still needs to be resolved. So uh, how do we actually do that? Believe it or not, um, a lot of these problems are actually solved by connecting people and teams together. So the connections between people and teams remove those silos that lead to software development inefficiencies. And so a lot of the processes and arrows and you know, all of the various different technical documents that you write, you know, that look like they're joining things up, it actually comes down to the human side of connecting people. Now, in order to do that, it's actually relatively easy. Now, you do need to bring, you know, your banking stakeholders along with you, you know, because, you know, there's a lot of um, when you're actually changing things inside um, an existing structure, you know, you need to make sure that the people who um, can advocate that change, you know, are on your side. However, they don't have to be massive corporate changes. You know, it can be within, you know, a couple of teams who are opposite each other. And ways in which you can do this are as simple as, getting people together for lunch and learns, you know, that you can actually do virtually like we're doing here today. Um, speaking and attending and, you know, going to virtual meetups, taking part in hackathons and tech sprints, even um, attending other people's agile ceremonies. And so you might get together as a scrum team every day to talk about your problems, but can you actually visit another team and um, eavesdrop on the problems that they're having? And then, you know, speak to them about how you can help them solve their problems as well. Then uh, we also have the wider open source project meetings and also open source repositories, you know, across GitHub and GitLab and, you know, other places where, you know, um, technologists and engineers hang out. And then you've also got the online wikis and online forums that you can take part in as well. And so that's bridging the gap through communication. That's not even sharing code. Then once you actually become very familiar with that, there are also ways in which you can bring those communities together. So you can push the boundaries just a little bit further, but from within the boundaries of your corporate firewalls. So you don't have to venture outside of your four walls in order to do this. And that's called inner source. So inner source enables internal team collaboration within the safety of your corporate firewalls. Now, this is where your infrastructure teams and all of your various different um, stakeholders will need to get involved because this is sharing code. This is bringing um, a system like GitHub inside the corporate firewalls and then opening up repositories, you know, and shared libraries for people to start collaborating and solving problems together. So inner source and GitHub, you know, within the corporate firewalls are example mechanisms that enable internal collaboration. And that's as well as, you know, attending meetups and getting involved in the very, you know, people to people aspect of, you know, growing your communities, sharing your learnings and helping each other. Then once you actually become familiar um, with the internal workings of what you need to do in order to collaborate as a team, open source communities develop and improve software through code contributions, idea sharing, defect fixing, documentation writing, and continuous education. But this is on the outside of your corporate firewall. So this is what we're actually doing today, you know, being an OSSEU. We're actually breaking outside of our corporate boundaries and we're coming together as a big joined up community in order to start um, developing and sharing ideas and learning together on the outside of our corporate firewalls. 
Now, as you can see through this um, this document, this is where um, Finos actually, you know, um, comes into into light. This is where a lot of you know the advantages of being part of an open source foundation, this you know, here to service the open source community for financial services comes into play. Now we're a very diverse and we're a very rich community of people across you know the financial services landscape. And we also um, have technologists, you know, who actually um, represent and develop a lot of the DevOps tools um, that we actually use in order to speed ourselves up, you know, as an engineering team. Plus, we also have technology companies, you know, who have an external perspective of how to solve engineering problems that we can actually bring into the Finos community, you know, that is an open source community to educate each other across the globe, across this diverse and rich community, how to do things differently, you know, how to solve those problems, how to bring that problem solving um, capability together. And then also, are there any projects that have been inner sourced maybe from within your organization, from within your financial services organization or your technology company that would also be of benefit to other people on the outside of your corporate firewall? So take for instance, um, Waltz, which was contributed into Finos is an example of a um, open source project that was actually developed by um, a Deutsche Bank team on the inside of Deutsche Bank that um, allows engineering architects and you know, other people in the technology area of Deutsche Bank to um, log and also communicate the topology of their internal um, architectures. The Deutsche Bank team, for example, and this is just one example of a Finos member, thought that it would be a great idea to take Waltz and then contribute that into open source. And so they did. And so they brought that into Finos um, and then we also have NatWest Markets, who aren't a Finos member, who are actually using vaults on the inside of NatWest to um, architect and then log the topology of their um, internal infrastructure using an Apache 2 licensed open source project that is continuously being updated and modified between NatWest Markets vaults and other people who are using it. Plus then we also have, you know, special interest groups that come together in order to share ideas. And we also have um, project teams um, who are using GitHub and GitHub issues in order to communicate problems and ideas and features, you know, across, you know, the global landscape um, of the open source community. And as you can tell, I'm from the UK and Tosha uh, is a colleague of mine in the US. And this is how um, Finos actually works. It bridges the gaps between teams, both um, within the same firm, but uh, plus also across multiple firms within the Finos membership. And so Finos supports and grows a safe and trusted open source community for the financial services industry across the, the um, financial services landscape. Now, the Finos community also bridges engineering team silos by solving common financial services technology problems from the collaborative open source vantage point. And so where inner source looks at the problems that you're trying to solve from the inside of your bank, Finos and the Finos open source community does that from a global reach. And so we have um, two projects uh, that we actually run uh, within Finos as part of our open source um, community that not only bring people together to you know, talk about their problems and help solve them, you know, as we do within our special interest groups and as we do as project teams, but within Finos, we're actually um, joining things together through all of the various different mechanisms um, of CICD, as people will be familiar with, through our open developer platform, which um, educates uh, financial services um, engineers on how to be an open source engineer using safe and controlled mechanisms of CICD development. And so this is where the community aspect of open source and the learning and the bridging the gap between people to people, um, this is where the rubber hits the road. And you actually bring all of those communication skills together in the open developer platform in order to create that CICD, you know, how do we take an idea from, you know, conception through to delivery, um, through writing, you know, feature stories, through having uh, project meetings, 
um, from being, being able to build, you know, our various different projects all the way through to how we actually document within the repository of our projects and then build a, a microsite for other people to follow and for other people to read our project documentation. ODP brings together um, all of that technology that you need to be a successful engineering team with um, all of the various different, you know, communication that you need in order to communicate as a project team as well. Plus, we know within financial services um, that we need to be uh, careful, we need to be safe, we are regulated, you know, you know we have uh, the watchful eye of the regulators on us. And so we also provide um, a project called Open Source Readiness, uh, which bridges the gap between how we engineer and how we deliver features um, with, you know, governance and the people from within inside the banks who need to be, you know, safe and secure. Um, that we're actually doing open source correctly, you know, and even people who haven't um, got any experience of open source can join um, open source readiness um, because we bring uh, speakers um, from across the industry into open source readiness to tell their stories of how open source has benefited them and how open source can also benefit you and all of the various different you know check boxes that you need to go through to take your firm from not being in open source through to being an open source firm um, plus we also talk about um, inner source as well because we understand that collaboration between people on the inside of the bank is just as valuable as collaboration between people and technology on the outside of the bank. And so Finos being the FinTech Open Source Foundation um, provides a safe place to share code and um, host repositories, plus provides all of the various different tools and mechanisms and people who have the experience in order to do this too. Now, um, once uh, teams actually start joining um, Finos and once you've crossed the threshold of, you know, uh, joining that first call um, or, you know, going to github.com forward slash Finos and finding um, our open source organization in GitHub, you'll notice that um, we have uh, a lot of valuable projects um, within our repositories um, that are actually there for the benefit of everybody within financial services. Um, and also for the benefit of people, you know, who want to break into financial services as well, because the Finos community actually helps people who want to become a financial services you know, engineer, but haven't got that experience and would like to join a team. So um, without focusing too much on our projects, I've just put a few examples you know, up on screen now. Um, so if you want to go to Finos, um, the Finos organization on GitHub, you'll notice that Goldman Sachs has just um, contributed legend. Um, we also have perspective for any um, JavaScript engineers or anybody who builds WebAssembly. You can go in there and see how charts and graphs are actually built by the JP Morgan team. Um, we have cloud service certification, which we're you know, putting a lot of energy into in order to create um, regulated, regulatory compliant um, infrastructure as code across all of the main cloud infrastructures. So GCP, Azure and AWS. Um, and we've got people from within banks and people within technology companies helping us with that. Plus, we also have a very um, uh, active and also successful um, standard called FDC3, um, which is about passing information across the uh, trading desktop and how you actually do that um, as financial objects in code. Um, so if you want to join a standard, FDC3 is absolutely um, a community that you should get involved in. It's very active and it's very popular. So drawing to the end of my talk, hopefully um, I've convinced a few people um, here um, to actually join the Finos community and give us a shot. You know, so if you are within financial services or if you are outside of financial services, please come to Finos um, and get involved. And there are multiple ways in which you can do that. Um, you can come and evaluate our software, you know, so just come and take a look at GitHub and, you know, um, evaluate locally. Um, you can consume our software from GitHub as well and use it. You know, it's Apache 2 licensed, so you're fully entitled to do that. You can join a project call or you can take part in um, any discussions through GitHub issues. You're absolutely more than welcome to do that. 
then you can start contributing code back into our repositories and become, you know, a, a member, a, a contributing member of a project team. And then as you kind of um, grow within Finos and within that Finos project, maybe you would like to lead one. So I know that we've got some lead maintainers, you know, coming up later um, within the mini summit that you'll hear from. Um, maybe that can be your goal um, to become a Finos lead maintainer. And there's a link there for you to follow as well to help you. So go to https finos.org, get involved to learn how to get involved. Um, and that brings me to the end of my talk. And so feel free to come and find the community. We're on GitHub, we're on Twitter, we're on LinkedIn and go to finos.org. And then with that, I'd like to hand over to Rob Underwood, Chief Development Officer at Finos for our next section. Thank you very much. Great, James. Thank you so much. Uh, appreciate uh, appreciate everyone being here, and um, you know what a great start to the day. Uh, at least for those of us on the East Coast, I know folks of you uh, in Europe, it's it's midday. So appreciate everyone um, being here. Um, I think we have a really great panel um, uh, coming up, and uh, you know I'd like to say. Um, you know, four good friends now um, uh, who have been part of the, the journey, which we'll touch on a little bit um, in terms of the open sourcing of Legend and some of the work that we've done with, um, with uh, ISDA and with Rignosis as well. So um, without any further ado, I'd like to introduce our panel. Um, so um, we have uh, four folks, uh, two from Goldman Sachs, one from Rignosis and one from is the so maybe um, we could start fee could you just maybe give a quick introduction of, of who you are and, and what you do and may, maybe a little bit contrasts the, the area of Goldman Sachs that you work in with the uh, area that Pierre does. Yeah, absolutely. So I've been at Goldman Sachs for 10 years and the first six years of those I actually spent supporting our derivatives businesses in their trading and the last four years or the most recent four years I've been within our data. Uh, management, so looking at how we build data models for our financial data and the governance around those as well. Um, and so sort of that distinction between myself and Pierre, um, looking more on sort of the business side and how we bring that business and engineering connectivity as we look to bring data models into the industry. Great. Uh, and Pierre, uh, would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah, hi, uh, I'm Pierre de Bolan. I'm uh, managing the data model engineering team in Goldman Sachs within uh, data engineering. Uh, you know, compared to Fi, I'm more an engineer. Like I'm uh, actually coding day to day. I manage a big team that actually work on tools like Legend, but also on tools like data governance, but I code also day to day and really enjoy actually programming. Uh, but we work really in partnership with the business, with Fi and others to make sure that we can achieve the, the bank's goals. Great, thank you. Uh, and Nigel from Magnosis, would you like to say hello and maybe tell us a little bit about yourself? Yes, thank you, Rob. Um, so, uh, so as Rob says, I work at Regnosis where I'm the senior data modeler um, with my primary responsibility being to partner with ISDA on the development of the CDM. Uh, prior to Regnosis, I was also actually at Goldman Sachs uh, where I was uh, for, for 20 years. Um, and worked uh, was working with Fee and set, set up the operations data modeling function prior to uh, departing, moving across to Regnosis. Fantastic. And Ian, would you like to introduce yourself? Thank you. Um, yes. Um, good afternoon. Good morning to everyone. Yeah, Ian Sloyan, uh, Director for Market Infrastructure and Technology at ISDA. Um, prior to that, I was the EMEA lead for data and reporting. Uh, dealing with a lot of implementations or regulations. Um, I have never worked at Goldman Sachs, um, but I have worked at other um, banks uh, looking at uh, technology projects, uh, regulatory projects, and uh, always in the, in the area of derivatives and how we represent derivatives data. I have seen you at 200 West Street, so I know you've been to Goldman Sachs before. So I think I've been at a few of the offices, yeah. <laughs> so, um, so for those of you who I don't know, I, I know we've alluded to it a little bit and, and James mentioned it before. So uh, legend.finos.org, and we'll talk a little bit about it through throughout the conversation today, but it is the um, 
a, mo a modeling language and a modeling workbench and suite of tools that um, Pierre led the development of within Goldman that's now been open source into Finos. Um, and uh, all of the people on the panel uh, had a hand in uh, the, the work, uh, the pilot that we just completed and in, uh, in the uh, open sourcing effort that uh, just uh, concluded. So um, and a big part of Alloy or uh, Legend is uh, um, data modeling. And, uh, um, and I know Pierre will, will clarify some of the use of that, that term too, but let's just jump right into it and um, kind of get into into some of the motivations of, of you know, perhaps the open sourcing of legend, but also some of the larger uh, industry issues. So um, just gonna open this up to all four of you. Uh, what are some of the current issues with regards to data uh, in the financial industry? Like why is, why is there this focus? Why is there this discussion on, um, on data and data models and common data structures and for the functional programmers in the crowd, maybe this looks like type definitions, and for the object-oriented programmers, maybe this looks like these look like classes. But whatever your your bent is, why is there all this focus on data in the financial industry? Uh, Ian, maybe you want to start, and then then Pierre, you can uh, add a little bit, and we'll turn it over to Fee and Nigel from there. Sure. Yeah, I'm going to take a very high-level approach because uh, I'm from the trade association, and um, far from any engineering background I ever had. Um, so thinking of thinking of ISDA, ISDA is the, the Swaps and Derivatives Association. So we come, you know, primarily backgrounds in derivatives markets. Um, you know, not everyone thinks of um, in trading interest rate swaps when, when they open up their 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 stockbroker app. Um, but but huge market, huge um, huge numbers. I think uh, Tosha um, uh, uh, called out some of the some of the statistics, but you know the 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 interest rate swaps market is, is around, you know, 500 trillion US dollar notional outstanding at any time. Um, those, those interest rate swaps tend to be, you know, of a, of a maturity profile, which means that the contracts might be in, in force for many years, um, you know, of those, of those, you know, perhaps 40% 40, 40 are, are kind of short dated one year, but beyond that, you know, there can be anything out to, to 25 years. The reason being because these derivatives are are underpinning, you know, commercial contracts, but also you know retail mortgages and and and, and risk management over over uh, you know pension funds and things like that. So to give you an idea, that's the the kind of the the markets we're talking about. Um, and obviously with, with that managing the data for those markets, you know, you have to you have to manage the payments. Uh, you have to to, to, to to have to happen every every quarter or every month. Um, you know, there's, there's many kind of obvious things that come to mind, um, but there's other things that that maybe the audience isn't isn't aware of. Uh, but you can probably guess from 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 the, the terminology. There's the exchange of margin on the back of these contracts. Uh, they have to be cleared. There's other risk management processes and, and finance and accounting processes that have to happen. Um, now I'm gonna I'm gonna um, uh, uh, rip off a, a colleague at Barclays who, who, who has said this in public that just one interest rate swap at, at, at Barclays uh, in particular, they did some analysis and they found that it was stored in 15 different places just, just when the trade was done within, within 24 hours. Um, and that was Dr. Lee Brain to give him the, the, the kudos there for, for that analysis. So 15 different locations to, to manage a trade through its life cycle. Um, that doesn't seem very efficient to me, um, but that is that is is is, is what happens today. Um, there's high values at stake, and, and the chances for inefficiency and mistakes uh, are obviously there. So how do we mitigate the problem of having the data in all those different places? Well, we've costly uh, reconciliations, and that's how the problems have been solved in the past. True, uh, you know there are different uh, ways of storing the data. Uh, different standards being used or, or, or variations on those standards. And we solve the problem by reconciliations between systems. Uh, and those, that, those don't really have any value uh, to, the, to, the, to the market. Um, to give you an idea of the cost of these businesses, uh, the CDM project, which I run, uh, we, we, we set forth to, uh, a couple of years ago to, to produce standards for, for processes that happen to trades through their life cycle. Uh, we surveyed members, and, and I'm quoting from a, a Deloitte paper, which is uh, on the future of post-trade, which I'd invite people to take a look at. Um, but 
we we were just at a, and I, I believe these are very conservative numbers, but we believe like through the CDM and its implementation on technology, uh, we could we could uh, see savings of, of 1.5 billion dollars uh, on the automation of affirmation, confirmation, and event processing. And those processes are uh, you know pretty uh, much as they sound, you know, uh, very basic data management processes. Uh, maybe presenting the data in a different way for a legal confirmation. Um, it's crazy they are manual at all, I would say. And having been uh, close to many of these processes in the past, it was always a frustration that we couldn't automate more. Um, you know, and, and, and you know, basically in, in a very lay terms, you know, it's just a case of saying, is, is this your trade data? Is it in the same standard form? Uh, do you agree to it as a client? And then can we provide it to the regulator? Um, so just to touch on uh, briefly why uh, some of the reasons for, for this state of affairs. Um, recently it is though, we, we, we wrote a letter to, um, uh, to the Financial Stability Board, um, IOSCO, the International Organization for Securities uh, Commissions, and the Basel Committee on Banking Supervision. And uh, together with uh, the other seven other trade associations, uh, we sort of set forward our commitment to, to, to moving to a digital future for financial markets. But the opening line of it really is the, um, uh, is the, is the area and calls out kind of some of the reasons why, particularly for derivatives uh, industry. Uh, we noted that uh, the, the G20 financial regulatory reforms, which were introduced in the wake of the financial crisis uh, about 10 years ago, uh, they fundamentally altered the traditional operating structure of bilateral financial markets. Firms have implemented these regulations and associated requirements on top of existing infrastructure, placing significant demands on it. So that's really one of the reasons why we're in this state uh, regulations. But but you know, in recent firms or recent years, firms have had to, to implement these things and, and often a, a, a under a, a clock and a regulator's watch. Um, but even removing that, there's been a lack of golden sources of, of product data. Uh, with, with, with some exceptions, which are actually uh, proved why, why they're important. And I think that's the future we're kind of aiming at and what the potential can be. Um, so I'll pause there because that was a, a quite a long winded first answer. And maybe Pierre will take sort of more, more of a, a detailed view on, on how he sees the problem. Yeah, well, I mean, my thinking is not that far. Like, um, as, I, as you explained, like a lot of parties are involved in processing financial data. And they, they can be found across the industry, but also within a company. So it's not because you work within an organization that you're not facing exactly the same problem of having like different step of processing and different hubs and different kind of uh, environment where the information is, is flowing. So, so why is like that? Like, I don't think it's that artificial. I think it's because processing financial information will require and requires a lot of special skills or special systems or steps that are you know, done by many actors. So, but you know, like this graph that you know, is not artificial, we, we have to deal with it. And uh, we have to, um, to, to, to manage the difficulties that come with like, un understanding like where the information is going and how it's flowing and how to smooth actually all, the, all this connection. So the first thing that I would say we have to do on this graph is to um, maintain it and make it available uh, you know, and make it like transparent, like uh, to actually all the actors of the firm, but also regulators and also like, uh, um, you know, auditors or anyone that want to understand better what is happening on our side. So definitely there's an operational aspect to it. Like if we understand how the information is flowing, it means that we can better manage our breaks, better understand the impact of something failing in, organi in our organization. I mean that we will we'll be more in control of actually understanding the information is sourced the right way, which is actually really important for regulators. Like data lineage and data analytics, you know, ensuring that if we produce a number, this number comes from the appropriate source is really important. And it's really hard to do that if we cannot maintain actually the graph of information within our organization and outside our organization. I would say like, uh, you know, on top of this graph, like what we see also is that we have to maintain uh, fairly complex data contracts that enforce data quality across parties. 
So why, again, because you have many, many actors that process information, all these actors get a different view on the data that they're processing, a different knowledge that they want to apply. So it's totally possible that someone downstream that process data would like to enforce some data quality constraints upstream, like when information is booked, when information is actually entered into the system. So, you know, when you have to manage this complex graph of information, you have to be able to make everyone contribute their vision of data quality in the system so that we can improve our data flow and improve our information is flowing. Um, the, the, the other part, you know, that comes out of this graph being complex is that we have to manage data privacy, data sensitivity. So, you know, when we flow information, you know, again, within a firm, we need to make sure that, um, the right person can see the right set of information and only the set of information that they are entitled to see. You know, and it's not possible, for example, a banker to have any information about trading. It's not possible that for some desk to understand the position of another. And it's obviously not possible for people to access private information from our clients or our employees. So, you know, like all these concerns are coming out of this kind of uh, fragmentation of information and flow of information. There's one last thing also that, uh, you know, I think is important and, uh, you know, different in the financial industry is um, that we have to milestone our information. Like it is super important for us to uh, be able to reproduce the state of information at one point in time. And it's really important to be able to reproduce compute, like in the context of an audit, for example. Like if someone come and say, you know, you produced this number six months ago, can you explain me why? So we will have to rebuild the state of information, the state of data out of milestone information and actually provide it to people. So, you know, that, you know, for me, like th these are like really the, the biggest like problems of data that we have to solve actually, uh, you know, day to day in, in our job. Cool. And Fee, what are your perspectives on this? And and maybe maybe you could talk a little bit about what it means to have models and and structures not only that are common within um, within Goldman, and that there's some of these um, issues that that Ian touched on around having representations of of you know what have you MX option, for example, in multiple places. But what does it mean to have common data models in the industry and, and what are you, some of your perspectives on these challenges from, from, from your seat within the Goldman organization? Yeah, I think the um, additional thing I'd add to sort of what Ian and Pierre have already mentioned is in current sort of world, the idea of data is commonly owned within engineering and that's sort of how it's developed across the tech industry and also in the finance industry more recently. And that role of strategizing and developing a data strategy um, is definitely sort of handled within engineering predominantly. And in finance, actually the business are the ones that actually create that data. And we have sort of perhaps lacked that communication in some respects between the business that are creating this data and the engineers that are sort of looking to store and process the data. And I think what we're starting to see and hopefully we'll continue to see is this communication between those two things to get to a much better state in the future as well. So I think that's one other current issue sort of we're working through. Um, so sort of what you were saying on the need for, for standardized data models, so for me, it's about the communication across the industry. So as, as Ian mentioned, sort of regulators are asking for more things. We've seen more transparency needed within derivatives markets, so through clearing. And all of these things are services that are provided by many different vendors out there. And being able to communicate with them at the moment is a one-to-one -one mapping between each of them. And if we can standardize that message and that communication, that's where we're going to quickly reduce those operating costs that Ian was mentioning for the business. Yeah, and Nigel, no. yeah, yeah, Nigel, maybe you could jump in a little bit with the perspective from Gnosis and also just some of the perspectives in terms of dealing with some of the regulatory concerns as well. Sure, I, I would definitely echo what, what Fee just said. Um, you know, uh, for, from the introduction here, th th maybe there's the misconception that there isn't digitization. In fact, there's huge amounts of digitization in finance and there's massive amounts of data. And it's that lack of standard, lack of a standard data model, which um, limits systems from being interoperable. Um, so, to to what Fee just said, in order to take data and transform it through the trade lifecycle, 
um, as it moves from execution through risk management, clearing and into trade reporting, having that common standard that allows the enrichment and transformation of that message whilst maintaining the underlying data integrity is, is critical. And that's, you know, particularly when we think about the regulatory reporting, which in many instances comes later on in the trade life cycle, if you lose that integrity as it goes through the transformations, by the time you start reporting to the regulator, you are you you know you have issues with your data, uh, and that that translates in to having uh, difficult conversations with regulators because you're reporting incorrect information. Is there is it something that I think is implicit in in I think everything that you touched on, but I would like to drill down a little bit more. Is is there something different or special about the the finance industry and the data problem within the finance industry so certainly the tech industry has been facing you know the 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 challenge of 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 data and data models and and all this you know the, going all the way back to the ERP days and 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 but is there something specific about the environment in which uh, the finance industry finds itself especially investment banking capital markets etc um, that that present some maybe some unique challenges that uh, need to be dealt with up yeah. here. Yeah, yeah. no, as I think everyone touched on, I mean, the importance of metadata tracking information about models and, and metadata around data is really paramount and critical to us. And when why is that? Like because when you look at uh, you know what the fin what the tech industry is uh, is working on is deal with enormous incredible incredible amount of volume of data for you know um, individual data sets and i would say you know if you look at the problem we're, we're facing like i would say for each individual individual data sets our volume is pretty much medium okay however we have a lot of data set, data sets they have a lot of depth and they are interconnected in a really complex way and i think that the difference you know we it's not a high volume um, simple data structure problem. It's like a medium volume, extremely complex depths of infrastructure that uh, of, of data structure that work all, all, all over the place. So because of that, the day-to-day the -day problem that, that we solve is not really like, oh, I ca how can I run this super complex calculation massively on an incredible large data set, which uh, the, the tech industry is doing super well with like so many framework and so many good tools. I mean, our problem really is more you know, out of this graph of information, where is the information I'm looking for? Like it's actually fairly complex sometimes to know even where to actually look at. You know, like the second thing people will ask, you know, when they find it, it's like, is it actually the right place? Like is it did the right originating source actually for the information that I uh, that, that, that I'm requesting, I'm request, re requesting, sorry. And like after people will say, but now am I authorized to see it? Okay. So obviously like system control that, but like if someone is looking at the information and cannot find information, they say, okay, I'm authorized. I should see that. Now, how can I acquire actually the rights to get the information, which is fairly tricky out of all these kind of that data set and all these actors that own like different kind of set of information. Like the, the then they are like, okay, now I, I, I'm untitled. How can I query it? How can I safely get the information? And once we get that, it's like, well, can I store this information? Can I redistribute this information? Because, you know, as, as we saw before, we have privacy and sensitivity, uh, you know, constraints in manipulating our data, but we also have licensing uh, constraints with actually the vendor that provide information to us. So, like, the, the, and when, when you look at, you know, what uh, Nigel was touching on about uh, re regulators, you know, like when we get this information and we're like, okay, but I see an error in this information. How can I make sure it's corrected at the right place? And how can I make sure it's not going to happen again? So you see like the, the, the kind of problem we deal with seem to be a little bit different than the, the kind of problem that the, the tech industry in so, is solving. So, and, and to answer and to, you know, be able to maintain all this kind of metadata, you know, around actually the information we process, the emphasis is really put on modeling, you know, modeling, meta modeling, so that we can also, you know, manage our models better, uh, you know, as much as possible, leveraging data standards and, uh, you know, data, um, the, 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 like data standards that are available outside so that when we communicate inside, we can easily communicate uh, outside. So, I mean, like really like, you know, 
being also uh, coming from tech, you know, like th that's kind of what I feel is really big difference. And that's why, you know, model is actually coming all the time in discussion in finance. So what are some of the, the complexity we've touched on a little bit, but, but uh, Nigel and Ian, any other sort of forms of impacts or, or types of issues that, that emerge from all of this complexity? Yeah, sure. And, and so, you know, developing on, on what Pierre said uh, and uh, reiterating maybe some of the numbers that, that Ian had given and, and Tosha referenced at, right at the start. You know, when you when you think about the notional of interest rate swaps that are traded, say, on a weekly basis, three to four trillion dollars, which is a very big number. But that, that translates into about 30,000 trades. So from a volume of messaging, 30,000 trades isn't a huge number of messages to be sending around on a weekly basis. Um, and 60% of those are traded electronically and 90% of those are cleared at a clearinghouse. So there's a lot of data that is being sent around, probably in a variety of data formats, or not probably, definitely, in a variety of data formats, um, depending on where the platform, where, what platform the trade was executed on, where it's being cleared, et cetera. And so if data in inaccuracies are generated, then there's a huge risk of operational error um, caused by either incorrect risk management of a position because the economic details are wrong or, or incorrect, uh, incorrect payments. So when you think about $3 trillion of notional, you know, a decimal point in the wrong place on a price or an incorrect settlement date makes a, very, makes a big difference. Um, and you regularly see in the news uh, issues that you know certain uh, counterparties experience due to some of these data inaccuracies. Um, the, the second thing I'll just talk about is the pace of innovation in the financial services industry. And this is where this, the development of the data model is, and the design of the data model is important. You know, any standard that, that's built needs to be sophisticated enough to capture the detail um, that, that Pierre spoke about. It also needs to be simple enough to be understandable by the users um, so that it can interpret the messages. It needs to be flexible enough that it can deal with the composability of financial products, which are tailored specifically in many instances to the individual transaction. Um, and that, you know, without the model needing to be continually redefined, but also with the tooling available, which sort of segues into what we're going to talk about, but with that tooling available, and the governance in place to extend that data model um, as required. So the common domain model we think has these characteristics um, and also provides a common translation layer between the many other standards that already exist um, to allow platforms to interoperate. Yep. Ian, did you want to chime in with something or? Well, yeah, I just maybe just to, to, to hark back to one of the points I made at the start, um, there's another element is that um, there's, there's, there might be relationship documents you need to reference, which are, which are long dated. You might have set up a trading relationship 10 years ago. And was that master agreement stored in digital form or is it a proxy for it held in some other static data system? All those things are challenging and, and, and it goes to sort of lineage as well. Where did this decision come from to make this payment? What's it based on? So that's the only thing I'd add. It, and it's another dimension to the, to the, to the problem. Uh, so it's, yeah, but I definitely echo the idea. It's complexity of the data rather than scale um, in volume. Great. So let's shift gears for a little bit. Um, we've got about uh, a half hour left and I want to make sure to, to leave some time for questions. So um, we're here at a, a summit about open source and um, probably a lot of folks are interested in, in where open source fits into all of that, which we've, we've discussed so far. So um, maybe, uh, maybe starting with Fee, how do you, so we just spent, you know, the, the four of us of, amongst the you know a group of you know about 20 25 other people we just went through this effort of of doing this this pilot of of using legend with uh you know several other investment banks and other institutions um and now legend is 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 open sourced and part of the open sourcing of the legend code is the fact that now we have these models that are built in the legend language that themselves are open sourced um so uh maybe fee starting with you Talk a little bit about why 
open sourcing data models, not just the code for the underlying workbench and language, but having the, the models themselves built uh, or, or being able to be distributed as, as open source code. Why is that a good thing? And what are some of the benefits that um, we're, we're sort of all expecting and, and, and should see within the industry from that? Yeah, thanks, Rob. So hopefully, from what we've already discussed, you can sort of tell the need for data models, um, and they definitely do exist in the financial industry already. Commonly, probably more so within individual institutions, but sort of CDM, as we've mentioned, being one of those standards externally trying to standardize the industry as a whole. And so sort of as you said, Rob, why open source? And I guess that standardization piece is the really important bit. That's the piece that's going to bring us our reduction of costs. Um, and our improvement in sort of trade processing. And so in terms of open source, I think of this in two ways. Um, so one is the visibility and the access to these models um, and, the, and sort of the benefits that that brings, but also the development of these models. And so from a development perspective, the sort of principles of open source in terms of early and often releases should bring us more speed and agility and that flexibility to improve these models quicker um, we should be able to add to and adjust when new use cases come up within the financial industry. And these could be from external factors. Um, we've mentioned regulation as one already, sort of as new regulations come in, definitely more data might need to be added um, and all of that sort of thing. So that speed and agility to be able to meet those demands and equally internal factors. So from the business perspective, they're always looking at diversifying across all the banks, including with clients. Um, and so how do we sort of meet those demands of new business? And that agility and flexibility to add to models quickly is, is gonna be important there too. The other sort of principles that I look at from an open source perspective, this inclusiveness community and that collaboration, I think all of that boils down to me to diversity of thought. And how do we actually tap into a lot more diversity that's out there, not just within the financial industry, but also within the tech industry and other industries that are working with data. I think there's a lot for us to learn within the financial industry in terms of how tech companies are developing and thinking about data. I'd say they're, they're probably one step, if not a few steps ahead of us in that space. And so I think we'd be silly not to, to tap into some of that as well. So within the industry side, I think historically, working with sort of industry bodies such as ISDA, lots of the, the larger banks and larger institutions in the market have definitely been engaged in this, this discussion and that idea of standardizing and building data models. But perhaps the clients and the vendors and, vendors and service providers haven't been able to get so in touch with those conversations. And so by open source, by that availability, by expanding that community, hopefully we'll get more diversity of thought from across the financial industry and as I mentioned, on the, on the outside industry side of things as well. So that's kind of how I see open source helping with the development of these models. And so when I talk about visibility, I guess that comes down to the principle of transparency. So these models are now open, they're available, everyone can access them. And that should hopefully help us speed up the adoption of these models as well. And really it's at the adoption level that we really gain the benefits. It's all well and good as having these data models available, but until they're being used, it's not gonna do as much help in reducing those costs. And so I kind of, they are connected. Um, that adoption is gonna come by having better standards, by having more heads at the table when we're building those standards. And hopefully that will speed up the adoption too. And finally, for me, it's governance. So I think we've sort of alluded to that as well already through this discussion, but sort of this financial data is going out to regulators, it's going on legal confirmations, it's requiring how much margin we're, we're settling. And so that governance over the data is, is vitally important in the financial industry too. In terms of the open source, so the SDLC of code brings us governance in that respect, in terms of how we are committing code, who's committing code, when it's being committed. Um, and also industry bodies such as ISDA um, have to be there to actually sort of govern who's putting into these, these uh, data models and, and how they're going to be used and sort of helping to disseminate that across the industry. Great. Um, and uh, Ian or Pierre or uh, any, any sort of other examples in particular and any, any ways in which you see open source models being used out already in the industry, um, Nigel as well. I'm not, I'm not sure who wants to jump first. Um, so I think Nigel mentioned um, that, you know, there are, 
there is digital data. Uh, we have, you know, standards in the past, um, such as FPML used for messaging. Um, but we've, you know, the CDM project at its heart is, is intended to be open source. Uh, we are, you know, that's what we've been, been doing. Uh, I think, you know, um, Nigel has a few examples of, of, of the things in particular, which, uh, which we, we probably present as, 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 as recent examples of using the CDM and implementing it. And that's what, you know, Regnosis have been working with, but is the members on. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Ian. Yeah, so um, so Regnosis has been working with with ISDA over the last three years uh, on the development of the common domain model that's on the Rosetta platform, um, the DSL <clears throat> of which is is open source. Um, the you know as to to what Fee said, you know, very it, the expansion of the community that's helping develop the the, the model is is um, you know. Very gratefully uh, received, and and the the more people that are developing the standard and contributing to it, the, the greater the penetration uh, will be, uh, which is obviously a virtuous circle. The you know the, there's been a number of announcements recently in the press over over the course of the year. Um, Axoni, uh, who, who are a distributed ledger technology platform, uh, are building a uh, a solution for the equity swaps market, which uses the common domain model. Um, there's also been recent announcements uh, around digital asset working with ISDA on a clearing pilot using their DAML language with the CDM as a model underpinning it. So yeah, and, and that, that's just two examples. There are a number of other uh, examples out there of firms that we're working with bilaterally um, on, on initiatives to, to adopt the CDM uh, natively. Uh, as well as you know, larger industry platforms that, that should be using the CDM and solutions uh, coming to market fairly soon. Yeah, so, I, I, yep. I would add to that actually. Uh, you know, CDM is definitely a great effort to uh, to be able to uh, start to get a common language uh, across the industry. But I would like to insist on something. Like, it's not only about open sourcing data models. What we want to do is also apply the tools and the SDLC leveraged by open source project to make it easier, you know, like for different companies to collaborate, exchange ideas, and agree on how to, to interoperate. Like, you know, what we want to do is to have new model version, you know, created quickly to address like needs of specific companies. Because what we see too often is that a company will have a specific need, will not want to go actually to the standard body and say, okay, can we incorporate? Because they may be in direct time crunch and they actually you know, don't want to make the investment and they fork and diverge from the language. So what is really important is to smooth this process, learn from you know, what the open source community has been doing for some time, you know, gathering a lot of developers or you know, like in this case, a lot of business actors and a lot of uh, technologists to, you know, refine the specification and and get you know a, a release of version that is really accelerated. Like our feel that we want to accelerate the process so that we never, or as less as possible, diverge from common language that is agreed uh, across the industry. So our feeling for that, you know, it's not it's not only about open source the model. We also really want the platform. To be open source, like uh, so that we can invite you know as many people around the table, so that the discussion can be you know um, more broadly agreed on, and so that you know we can achieve this agreement and not diverge. And that, that is really why you know we felt that we wanted to open source our platform to make you know this acceleration and this kind of uh, community-driven modification of model real. Yeah, I I just like to jump in and and and. and and back up what Pierre just said. Um, and indeed, that's sort of the limitations of some of the standards and data standards which we have today. Even um, our own uh, other standard that is the FPML, the development of FPML has seen a lot of people have their own internal uh, fork, uh, their own variation of it. Uh, and it's not a standard if it's not the same everywhere. Um, and you know, the development of some other messaging standards, you think of the the, the, the life cycle to get a change into Swift uh, for, for, um, for FX transactions, a lot of those standards. The, the timeline to, to deliver things is just uh, often uh, too slow 
and people then make bad decisions around forking and creating their own variations. Uh, so that's definitely why it's of interest uh, to ISDA to see new, new standards delivered and developed indeed in this way. So I want to open this up to questions in a second. So if, if folks are interested in asking uh, some questions about to any of the folks or all the folks on this distinguished panel, um, please uh, use the Q&A feature. I see that James is providing some guidance uh, on that in the chat. So um, definitely you know, ask questions so we can start um, start uh, getting into those. We, we want to make this interactive. Um, so uh, you, you've touched on um, FPML and, um, and then there's also been some discussion of sort of the case for open source and um, you know, hopefully we have a, a sympathetic audience uh, today. Um, where do you see this going? So, so, um, so you know, there's the Rosetta DSL. There's the Legend uh, language. There's the Legend platform that's been open source. Um, we're I think we're all feeling a groundswell of support for open sourcing. Clearly, Goldman's announcement last week was. Um, a big shot in the arm. The Morpher uh, project, which we're going to hear about in 20 minutes, is a, another example. Um, where do you see this going? Where, 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 what's look out? You know, hopefully 12 months. We're not all having to wear these things everywhere, and and we're all back seeing each other and um, able to head to the pub. But besides that, where do, looking out 12 to 24 months, where where do you see this going in terms of open sourcing around data models and and also the adoption of uh, some of the CICD practices that James alluded to or referred to in his presentation a little earlier and that Pierre touched on. What's the future for open source in, in this area around data models? Uh, and maybe maybe Fee, if you wanna give some perspective first on the, some of the stuff you saw coming out of the pilot and then maybe uh, Ian, you can shed a little perspective as well. Yeah, sure. I think sort of out of the pilots, we wanted to make sure we were contributing to something meaningful in the industry. And I think that's really where the future of this has to go. And so in terms of as we look to improve standards more broadly, um, that input of thought that I spoke about before um, is going to be a big, a big player in that. But we've also got the opportunity to expand a lot more broadly now. So I think we've discussed quite significantly today around sort of this idea of what we would consider transactional data. So sort of that, that specific trade data, the, the life cycle of a trade. There's lots of other areas of data within the financial industry as well, whether that's reference data in terms of the actual underlying products that we're trading, whether that's market data in terms of pricing that's available and, and how do we get all of these things to communicate actually and look at the entire life cycle of a trade from inception all the way all the way through and some of that's transactional but as I mentioned a few other data sets as well and so that expansion is going to be really important. I think also considering new use cases and some of the nuances often in the financial industry we start with sort of the bigger volume first and as we get through that we're going to end up with some of the more complex exotic pieces and they're going to start to raise questions of perhaps what we've got already and how we're going to improve what we have there whether that's adding to or adapting current attributes and current models. So I think that's in terms of sort of improving standards and pushing the industry in that sense. I mentioned before as well, this idea of cross industry. I think there's a lot for us to learn about the acceleration of data driven transformation across multiple industries, uh, not just in finance. And so I'm definitely excited to see where that is going to go in the future. And I guess that pushes into one final thing for me is the innovation that's gonna be available. Um, I think lots of these things and there's been little bits of pockets discussed around in the financial, financial industry in terms of new technologies, being able to branch into blockchain, smart contracts. But I think actually as we open source and we move further, we're going to be able to gain on what's happening in the technology industry and hopefully find better, to, better solutions than we can even think of today um, on how we're going to solve some of these problems that we have. Yeah, I would like to add on that, like, you know, as, as, as she said, and as Ian said, and even Nigel too, like, what we want to do is, is to accelerate the standard, accelerate CDM, accelerate like maybe other standards that address different, different areas, actually, for, for business from a standardization and model perspective. Like, and we felt like, you know, to, to do that, to open source the platform. So what we would like to do too, is make sure that we can try to gather more community in terms of development of the platform. Like if people are interested, like the site is at legend.finance.org. 
And you know, like to, to make sure that we can open contribution that people don't see the project being biased or you know, like uh, held by a specific company, we open source under Finos. Like we provided, like we gave the code actually to the Finos uh, Foundation that is hosting our code, hosting the process of uh, development of our code now. Uh, we, they also host actually our platform so that different banks can work together into a total neutral environment that is not like specific to, to, to a bank, like it is part of this organization, you know, which is great, like that allows us to work actually together, uh, to, together better in a safe and uh, easy way. So, you know, what, what I really would like to see in the future, hopefully, is like acceleration of the model, but also acceleration and contribution on making the platform better so that we can include, again, the business users and the technologies in building these models that are, that are going to be already, already hopefully transformative in the industry and make things faster, leaner, and safer uh, in terms of operating uh, financial information. Great. Yeah. Go ahead, um, Ian. Yeah, just just to, to, to add, like I'm equally excited that the diversity of, 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 of views that could come along and, and really uh, we'll see real innovation. Um, that's very exciting to ISDA, um, you know, and also, uh, you know, ISDA's mission um, is, you know, safe, efficient markets, uh, but also trying to, 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 to make access to those markets a lot easier. Um, and how we do that is by making things, you know, open source. Uh, is this legal standards? The master agreement was essentially an open source document, which was published in the 80s, which made, you know, interest rate swap market, which was a bilateral market between a couple of banks, you know, across the Atlantic, um, to to go from a, you know, a few hundred million to the trillions, the hundreds of trillions we quoted earlier. Um, this is the same thing. Uh, we give people access to the same technology, um, the same software uh, that, that banks can use. We can only see good things happen. The, uh, the only uh, one thing I would add is um, you know, an area of particular focus for, for ISDA and Regnosis is development of digital regulatory reporting. Um, you've touched on that through this conversation, and, and we think that um, partnering with regulators to create machine readable, machine executable reg reporting, we can drastically reduce that cost of compliance. The CDM is a, is a core component of that because it provides the common data model to, to represent the transactions. Um, and that was recognized recently in a G20 uh, tech sprint competition. You know, that's a, that also is a, is a you know, good link to the Finos reg tech work stream. Which is focused in this space. Um, so there, you know, there's crossover between uh, multiple FinOps work streams also, and looking forward to working together on on that topic um, together with Rob and others as the uh, agenda progresses. Just Nigel, just a, Nigel you, na you nailed those talking points. It was great. Yeah. Sorry, go ahead. Just, one, just just something on that that to maybe give that what what we just talked about the digital regulatory reporting. Um, I, I was speaking to a particular uh, sort of large global entity in the financial services, um, a large sort of regulatory entity, you might say. Um, and they, they talked about changing the culture of how we deliver regulation. And I thought that was a great phrase to, to, to change that, you know, to have these open models, which we can all work on together and also have that conversation with regulators and demonstrate what we mean when we say your regulation doesn't work or you need to improve the law here because it's unclear to the market. We can demonstrate that with data now through models and through platforms like Legend and, and, and the CDM. Yeah. Fantastic. So I think we have our first question. Um, so Adam Jones asks, uh, uh, and, and maybe uh, I'll pose this first to uh, uh, Pierre. Um, how can someone primarily from a technical background get involved in Legend to start leveraging and contributing to the use cases? And I'll, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna also concurrently send some information that people can see, but Pierre, uh, how can folks start to get involved in, in Legend and, and maybe start looking at the models and maybe even doing some pull requests and, and stuff like that? Yeah, well, so, so there's a lot of depth and a lot of things to do there. So, I mean, first, you know, you can look at the code on the GitHub uh, website of um, the, 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 the GitHub areas of, uh, of Pinos. Um, the, the project is structured in many modules and there's uh, there are things to do for 
all kinds of developers really. Like the, the, the first thing is like studio, uh, which is our like uh, edit, editional environment where people can, uh, you know, work in JavaScript to improve the way people enter model, manage model, uh, enter code. There's the pure language itself, which is uh, a big language where you know, people that really like language can work on, um, modify, uh, tweak. And there's um, like the full platform with like the SDLC management where we can add more SDLC plugin. Like right now our SDLC backend, I would say is GitHub, but it's totally possible to add a new backend and integrate with different kind of SDLC. Like that's for the area we have today. Like going forward, we're going to open source more code um, leveraging the pure language for transformation. Like when we interface with different data sources, like relational database, and we want to map our model to different kind of infrastructure, we actually write a lot of transformation code that goes model to model. Like for example, how to transform a pure function into our SQL query so that we can translate um, a request coming from a business user that's not a technologist into a technology request that will leverage an infrastructure. And that's like, um, that's a space where, you know, me and my team spend, spend a lot of time, you know, how can we translate, you know, and leverage models and model to model transformation to be able to access information. I mean, that's if people want to contribute, like from a leveraging perspective, like, you know, like you can start to leverage the platform to define models that you can transform into different kind of technology of serialization, like for example, protobuf, uh, JSON schema, uh, whatever for serialization purpose. Going forward, you'll be able to use these models and map them to infrastructure and provide a query tool uh, for actually your users. Going forward also will also uh, allow people to translate it, uh, this query and this metadata, metadata that is gathered to acquire information, to deploy it um, in production into a service environment. So that, that, that's the kind of thing that we operate uh, day to day on our side and that we're going to progressively contribute actually to the open source project. Great, great. Um, and uh, if folks have any more questions, don't hesitate to, to ask them. I've, I also posted um, some more uh, follow-ups uh, with links uh, to add them to your question. Um, another question that we get, uh, or we've been getting, and, and probably bears a little bit of, 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 of context and explanation, uh, and it's in the README, is we use, the Legend Project uses GitHub and GitLab, and sometimes people are like, oh, how, how, where do they fit in? So GitLab provides the SDLC um, for the modeling efforts. So when you're in Alloy Studio and you're working on the models uh, themselves under the hood, there's uh, a GitLab instance that's managing the, the models uh, as effectively open source commits and, uh, and, and, and that's abstracted uh, through Studio. And then as Pierre alluded to a second ago, we then, and the actual underlying code, so the, the builds of Studio and SDLC and all the components to Legend itself happens through um, GitHub. And what's really interesting, and I think um, a, a real, I, I know Pierre and I have talked about it one-on-one um, -on -one a bunch of times, but one of the things that really I'm excited by is the fact that um, the builds are happening on Finos infrastructure on the GitHub uh, public repos. And so this is really authentic open sourcing. This isn't just a case of Goldman having put the code out there and then it's got its own fork, um, you know, behind the firewall. And that's where all like the, the nightly goodness of builds and stuff is happening. Like the CICD stuff is actually authentically happening outside the firewall on the public infrastructure, on the public Finos GitHub infrastructure and the models are hosted and, and controlled through through public GitLab infrastructure. So it, it's, it's pretty cool. Yeah, no, I would, I, would, I would continue on that a little bit. So there's a difference yep. between how we, we operate the code of our platform, which is in GitHub, yep. but the models, which is in GitLab. Exactly. And, and it's really important to understand that we need SDLC to operate on models because you know, like the point of the, 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 the effort that we're running within our firm and hopefully outside our firm is to make sure that we can drive a lot of information flow through metadata um, so that the business can be involved, but that also that this metadata can execute actually in production flows. And there's no way we can execute in production flow without, without following a proper SDLC. 
the same way, you know, there's no way we'll be able to accelerate, um, you know, the collaboration and the work with other entities if we don't follow the tools, you know, that people follow every day in engineering of SDLC so that we can make, you know, a lot of changes really faster, but in a super safe way and open way so that people understand who is making the modification at one point, who reviewed the information, how, for example, this information will then be actually published to a standard, you know, like, like CDM, uh, you know, like, so the notion of SDLC is really key there because what we found, you know, like looking at um, the way people manage dictionaries usually is that they are, they are managed by business people, but they, they diverge extremely from what's happening in real life in system. So we have this kind of beautiful set of information that people like to communicate about, write PowerPoint on and others. But when it comes to, but what's happening in real life, you have a totally different picture and answer. So, you know, like making a language that is like easy to use by business user that make the business user enter actually the specification and, and other parties too, but make all, also all that executable, audited, uh, and, and manageable so that we can execute on it and actually get, you know, what you see, what you get effect between what, what people communicate on, but what is actually happening in real life in, in system and in data flow. Yeah, so following up on that, there's another question in the Q&A. So uh, with regards to the SDLC and the open models, uh, what steps are taken to test the models themselves? How are the, how are the models tested? Uh, well, so, uh, you know, like th th there, there are many strategies actually to test models. So we're not using a logic based approach of models. Um, what we're doing is more like uh, something, a, a type system that is closer to object oriented with the functional uh, uh, language applied to it. So testing a model is an interesting thing. Like the first thing that we ask people is uh, to add constraints and validation to uh, really specify really clearly what the intent in the context of the model. Now, the test comes to when you map this model to different data sources, and you want to ensure that the question that people are asking are actually accurately uh, answered. So what we let people do is enter model, enter mappings, and next to the mapping, write a set of tests, which are like a set of questions that they would ask with a set of sample data that will actually retrieve information. There's a lot of depth too here about like uh, generating test data to actually activate models. So we have strategies that, 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 that source information from our system, cipher it and actually make it available so that you know, we protect that the test data is not actually providing private or sensitive information. Um, but I would, say, I would say the first thing is to guarantee your model is consistent, to refine it with constraints and guarantee that these constraints for tests are violated when they should be violated. The second one is to make sure that when we map actually these models to a different infrastructure and people ask questions, they get back what they want. And, um, you know, like to, to give a, a feel of the number of tests that we operate right now for the models that we have uh, in, our, in, in our premise, and we're around like 12 to 13,000 tests that we run for each commit, actually, because we are in a total continuous, um, continuous development uh, process. So, 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 yeah, to give a feel that that is like the, the kind of volume we have. Yeah. Great. Um, we have time for maybe one more question. Um, so if, if anyone would like to uh, ask uh, a question, please do so now. Um, in the meantime, um, uh, Ian, Fee, and, uh, um, uh, and Nigel, maybe just a, a, a quick a closing thought or two as, as we bring this to a close. Um, any, any final thoughts on our, our, our glorious future of open sourcing data within financial services? Not really. I think we said it all. I think we're very excited um, to see the shift. Uh, I can certainly um, attest to the fact that you know uh, these these stuffy old financial institutions uh, have have really changed their minds and they're starting to see the benefits of open source and a lot of the new technologies in the last couple of years. In a way, we we have been really really happy to see. Great, Nigel or Fee. Yeah, I think for, for me, it's sort of that excitement of where this is going to go next. And I think if anything, it's probably a call to, to everybody to sort of 
get involved, whether you're finance or not finance, there's ways of doing that, whether through FINOS or other industry bodies, sort of start contributing to this and we'll, we'll start to see where that innovation takes us. Yeah, I'd, I'd echo all of that. The, the acceleration that we've seen over the last few months through the uh, FINOS pilot work streams uh, has, you know, we've had a huge amount of development in, in the CDM just over very short space of time. So it's really exciting to see and, and hopefully that will continue. That's great. And, and I will attest to the lack of stuffiness because I actually put on a collared shirt today for the first time in a year, but I know full well that if I were to wear said collared shirt to the 23rd floor of 200 West, I would be overdressed. So and Pierre's laughing because he knows it's true. So uh, uh, anyways, I'd like to thank everyone on the panel. This was fantastic. Really appreciate it. Um, if you have any questions about, um, about legend, uh, don't hesitate to ask at legend-inquiries, legend-inquiries at finos.org. Um, there's you know, lots of information. Definitely dig in as well on the ISTA CDM and some of the good stuff happening there and uh, the work uh, that the Rignosis team is doing in Rosetta and which is uh, uh, the DSL that the CDM is represented in. Um, so lots of good stuff happening. Thank you to everybody who's here. Um, so with that, I'd like to turn to our next panel. And, and I, I, I have to say that the next panel is a panel I'm, I'm also really excited by. Um, uh, the Morpher contribution to Finos was another uh, large contribution this year from uh, Morgan Stanley. Um, and uh, there's actually some really interesting uh, sort of relationships between uh, the, what uh, the legend contribution from Goldman and, and some of what's possible in Morpher from Morgan Stanley. So without any further ado, I will turn this over to Stephen Goldbaum from Morgan Stanley. Hey, everyone. All right, thank you. Um, Tosha, I think. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us today. We're very excited to be here and really thrilled to, for the opportunity to introduce you to Open RegTech and the way the financial services industry is leveraging open source to comply with complex regulatory requirements. I'm honored to be part of this panel today, along with uh, Stephen Goldbaum, Executive Director at Morgan Stanley, and Mark Marin, the designer of the Bosky programming language and principal research uh, software development engineer at Microsoft. I'm Aitana Miol. I'm a strategic initiatives manager with Finos, the FinTech Open Source Foundation, which is part of the LF. As you may have heard in the opening remarks earlier today, we are a member-based organization. Our members include some of the largest investment banks, as well as tech firms, fintech firms, and vendors. And our goal is to enable open source in financial services. And we have a community of hundreds of developers and subject matter experts from financial institutions, uh, tech firms and, and vendors collaborating on our open source projects and leveraging the efficiency, the cost savings, and all of the other benefits of open source. We host over 40 active and incubating projects, all of which live on our Finos uh, GitHub organization, and some of which you will learn more about today. So earlier this year, we launched our Open RegTech initiative in response to two complementary realities. On one side, by definition, our projects focus on, on technology solutions to common challenges and use cases in financial services, and uh, importantly, uh, solutions that do not provide a competitive advantage. That is to say that our projects target challenges for which many organizations would need to normally build a similar solution. And the idea behind our open source projects is to bring all of those actors together, get them to collaborate on building a solution, and most importantly, to stop uh, reinventing the wheel and wasting time and resources to develop the end iteration of a very similar solution. And at the same time, we're promoting open source and financial services but we were missing the perspective of a key industry participant, which are financial regulators. And not only were we as a community missing them, 
but they were also missing out on all of the opportunities and, and benefits of open source collaboration. Therefore, we launched the Open RecTech initiative within FinOps with a twofold objective. First, to streamline and mutualize regulatory compliance efforts at banks through collaboration and open source projects. And on the regulator side, the goal is to get them familiar and comfortable with open source, address the concerns they may have, and also show them the potential of open source for regulatory supervision and for issuing regulation. Our very ambitious vision for open rec tech is a model in which regulators adopt open source code and best practices and define regulations in open source code form while retaining full visibility on, on their supervisory activities and, and monitoring. And where on the other end, industry participants collaborate to codify and standardize those regulations and to mutualize the interpretation of, of regulatory requirements. We know this is a very ambitious and, and long-term goal, but we're very excited about the interest and engagement that we've seen from the community so far. And we're also looking forward and working hard to uh, see this vision become a reality. So where do we stand now? Uh, when we launched the initiative earlier this year, we were expecting we'd need to do a lot more work to educate and convince regulators about the benefits of open source and also to debunk the myths around open source security and vulnerabilities. But we have been very pleasantly surprised uh, by the response from the regulatory community, both in the US and in, in Europe, who are a lot more familiar and comfortable with open source than we initially thought. And I also think it's safe to say that they're already on the next phase. So they're eager and looking forward to identifying use cases and, and projects to start collaborating on. Some regulators in the US, like the CFPB, are really mature open source consumers and contributors, and even have an open source first policy. So they do all um, in open source. We are in in ongoing conversations with US and European regulators to discuss potential collaboration opportunities and even some potential open source contributions by regulators, which is really exciting. Uh, we have also had AIR, the Alliance for Innovative Regulation, join FINOS as an associate member recently. AIR is a US nonprofit uh, focused on promoting innovation in financial regulation. And we will also have representatives from the CFPB and former regulators join our upcoming open source strategy forum on November 12th and 13th. And more recently, just last week, our board approved the creation of a regulation innovation special interest group led by ING and the Alliance for, Finan for Innovative Regulation which will provide a venue for regulators and financial institutions to discuss and identify specific challenges um, that they like to tackle through open source collaboration. Special interest groups, just to um, uh, clarify that because it's, it, it may not be a, a very common term, um, they're supposed to work on the problem space or the definition of the problem or challenge and then once that's been identified, it would be up to uh, a project to develop a, a solution through open source software and, and standards. On the other branch of our twofold effort, uh, the one around identifying projects for financial institutions to collaborate on, we've seen fantastic progress as well. Uh, one project we're particularly excited about is Morphir, which was recently contributed to the foundation by FinOps member Morgan Stanley, and which has tremendous potential to drive open source collaboration on regulatory reporting and compliance. Morphir is a multi-language system built on a data format that captures an application's domain model and business logic in a way that is agnostic to the technology. So um, Morphir allows you to have business knowledge available as data and to process it programmatically, translating, visualizing, um, sharing, and storing data. 
And more relevant for our RecTech initiative, the team at Morgan Stanley has um, already used Morphere to calculate liquidity coverage ratios as mandated by federal regulations in the US, essentially by uh, turning regulation into code. I won't take any more time talking about Morphere because we have the honor to have uh, Stephen Goldbaum on the panel today, who's the co-creator of Morphere and an executive director at Morgan Stanley. Uh, Stephen, the floor is yours. Thank you, Aitana. So providing regulations is code. Why would we want to do this? Well, first of all, regulations are incredibly complex. So turning them into running systems is an expensive process. So having every firm do that across the industry means that that expense is expanded across the industry. So it just makes good business sense to say, well, maybe we can share the effort, we can share the burden. And by doing so, everybody wins. And in the process, maybe we get even more accuracy. Of course, that means a good deal of challenges on the technical side. For one thing, we're talking about sharing complex logic. So while the industry is fairly good at sharing data and figuring out how to use data across different technologies, um, sharing logic is a much bigger and more difficult problem. Um, we want to make sure that we're not excluding any industry or any firm. So there's a vast amount of different technologies across the industry. We can't really say, well, we're going to solidify on one technology and everybody's going to have to use that. And if you don't already use that technology, then you're going to have to do an expensive rewrite in order to support this. That's just not a viable approach to, to something that needs to be used industry wide. And even more importantly, we don't want to get in the way of evolution of technology. So we all know that technology is evolving very quickly and we wouldn't want to regulate Tory or regulation as code to stand in the way of firms being able to adopt newer and better technologies. And the maybe the biggest challenge of all of this is that the whole thing is to be incredibly accurate. Even one small mistake can mean financial impact across a number of firms. And so we have to make sure that this is correct. There's no ambiguity and that there are as many guarantees that this is correct as we can possibly get. So given all these technical challenges, how, I, how might we approach this? Well, we're gonna look at a technology called Morpher that was recently contributed by Morgan Stanley to FinOS. So the core of Morpher is all about defining a, a standard for translating business logic across technologies. And so what Morpher does is it provides a data structure called an intermediary representation that we can encode business logic in and then a set of tools to process that business logic into different contexts. So some of those processors might do things like provide real-time documentation that, that is always up to date or even interactive documentation that users can use to audit uh, results that they might think, wonder how they got to that. Uh, similarly, we might wanna take that business logic and translate it into other programming languages so that it can be run in different execution contexts. Or we might take that idea even further, and if our firm has a, a standard set of platforms, we could actually generate entire applications from the business logic that conforms to those platforms and regulations. And so when we think about coding regulations, that's exactly what we want to do. We want to be able to say, well, here's the business logic, it's coded up, and here's the tools to, to either generate the, the tools that exist or to customize those tools for our, our firm and our firm standards. And so you might ask, well, how do we code the regulations in the first place? Well, Morpher doesn't make any, any um, dictate any particular way of doing that. Uh, we do offer support right now for Elm, the Elm programming language. We do that because Elm is a very simple language. It's a pure language, meaning that it's it's, there's no side effects. It, it has to, the developer has to think about business logic and business logic only. And it provides a lot of guarantees in terms of the correctness of the models and making sure that uh, we don't have any errors. And as we mentioned, it's very important that we don't have any errors because that could have some serious financial impact. 
And so to get an idea of what this looks like in practice, we're gonna look at something called the liquidity coverage ratio. And I'm scrolling through this just to show that right now it's provided in hundreds or thousands of pages of very dense prose. And so, you know, wow, imagine taking this and trying to turn that into a computer system when we're looking at something like page like 61,000 or something like that. You know, that, that would be a daunting task uh, for anybody. So obviously, uh, if that were provided as code, we wouldn't have to do that. And the interesting thing is that if you look at the documentation, it actually looks a lot like code in a lot of places. So you can see how it can naturally translate from, you know, maybe this document could actually be, be done in code, right? And so we're looking at something right now, the, the definition of a counterparty. And so a counterparty is limited to this list of values. And we know in programming that that translates to something like uh, an enum or a union type. In this case, in Elm, it's a union type. And you can see how the, the code naturally flows from the documentation. Uh, similarly, this, this table actually is a specification in the, in the documentation in the LCR that um, specifies how do you figure out what maturity bucket uh, something lies in. And so it's presented in this kind of arcane format with a lot of explanation. But really what it turns out to be is very simple code. Um, and so we can see that here in, in, our, in our model. Um, so looking more into like rules and categorization, uh, there's a lot of rules in terms of how do we classify assets and cash flows. Um, and those, those rules again are in, in dense prose. And um, when we look at the, the actual model, we see that it's actually pretty simple programming language um, constructs. And uh, that's actually something that we want, right? We wanna be able to look at this program and be able to understand it uh, for, for, for many reasons, least of all, I mean, most of all, maybe because as many people look at it and can understand it, uh, then we can catch um, you know, errors and bugs and make sure that it's correct. Uh, and finally, so if you go look up the LCR, the, probably the first thing you'll find is this, this equation, that the LCR is really a mathematical equation of the high quality liquid assets divided by the total net cash outflow. Um, and so the LCR provides this kind of calculation, math-oriented calculation document as a supplement that we can use to create the same code, right? And we can see that it's very, very similar. In fact, if you go to this document and if you go to the uh, LCR example on morpher.examples, you'll see that it's basically one-to-one -one between the document and the code, which means that, you know, th this is th the idea of providing a regulation as code is really a an achievable process. So at this point, you might say, well, that's great. You've got, the, the regulation in code, it's in Elm. We don't run Elm, so what are we gonna do with this? Well, that's where Morpher comes in. So with Morpher, we have a set of tools. Uh, one of those tools parses Elm into the Morpher IR. And as you recall, the Morpher IR is that common data format that all the business logic is, is saved in. So you can see here's some of the concepts that we saw in, in the model before, level one assets, level two assets. Uh, this is the Morpher IR. And so now that we're in the Morpher IR, we can then generate from that IR into other languages or other platforms. And so we're looking at the Scala generated code from, from essentially from what is Elm into Morpher and into Scala. And some of the other things that I mentioned that we generate are things like documentation. Um, we can support other languages. We've had generators in SQL before. Uh, so there's a range of things that we can do with this. And that's where Morpher helps out with the industry by providing a set of tools that are, that are already common, like the Scala generator, and then providing tools that different firms can use to customize the output to match their own platforms. And again, that's exactly what we're after. We don't want to make firms rewrite their platforms. We would rather provide the tools that take the regulation and allow them to adapt that regulation onto their existing systems 
rather than take the regulation and say, well, you've got to write, rewrite everything in order to, to make this work. So I'm going to finish up with, well, one of the things we mentioned is that the regulation has to be correct. And um, in this case, the LCR provides a number of examples to, to ensure that basically everybody's understanding this correctly. And examples are great because we all know we can turn those into unit tests. And so uh, in our example, that's exactly what we've done. Elm has a unit testing capability, so we can use the capabilities of Elm to unit test our, our regulation as code. Um, while unit tests are great and they do catch a, a certain a lot of bugs, um, we really want something better than that when it comes to regulations. So uh, as I mentioned before, you know, if there's even a small error in the regulation, that could have pretty significant financial impact. So we want to do whatever we can to make sure that those regulations are correct. And Elm is great in that it catches a lot of errors that a general purpose programming language wouldn't catch. So things like, oh, if you forgot to, to handle a certain case of, of enum, it will catch that and it won't compile and you'll have to correct that. So you can guarantee that there's a certain quality level and the common saying is that if it compiles, then it's guaranteed to run without runtime errors. And that's true of Elm. Turns out that we can actually do better. And again, doing better is just gonna be that much better for the industry. And so next I'm gonna introduce Mark Marin from Microsoft Research to show us how we can use the Bosky language to reduce risk and increase confidence. Oh, great. Thank you very much. Uh, as I mentioned, my name is Mark Marin. Uh, I'm from Microsoft Research. And I'm going to be talking about the Bosky programming language and how, how it can be used to build high assurance model code in a framework like Morpheer. So to start off with uh, the Bosky programming language project, it's uh, a programming language. We've been working it here at Microsoft Research, and it's focused on exploring the boundaries of what is possible with building high assurance software using techniques like formal verification, model checking, um, automated fuzz testing. And what we're doing is we're taking a slightly different approach than, than usual. And instead of taking an existing language and attempting to retrofit an analysis on top of it, we're actually looking at what things make building one of these analysis difficult and what makes them work really well. And we're trying to build a programming language specifically to get as much as we can out of one of these analysis, to take away all the things that make them very difficult to scale or make precise. And uh, in the interest of the fact that this is the Open Source Summit, I also want to mention that all this work is happening uh, public on GitHub, uh, open source licensed. So this is freely available to everybody who's interested, both the core language itself and then the collaboration we're starting up with uh, Morpheer with the support of FinOS. So as I mentioned, there, this is sort of a, a, a reverse of the usual design process. Usually you build a high level language and then you build an intermediate representation and then you build tools. We're sort of going the other way around. So Bosky, we wanna target some tools. And the first thing we're doing is building an intermediate representation that makes those tools as powerful as possible. And what comes out here is a lot of the time there are simple things that come out in the intermediate representation, like is it a bytecode based versus register based? How does it expose iterative constructs? And these can have a huge impact on both the difficulty of building these kinds of verification or analysis tools, as well as the final results that they're able to produce. So we're building this IR specifically to make these tools as powerful as possible. All right, um, by excluding things like uh, un unbounded looping constructs or random, a lot of indeterminate behavior. Once we have that, the next question was, how can we build on top of this IR a very friendly, high productivity programming experience that developers uh, expect when coming from a modern platform, right? So we want to have familiar language constructs that allow rapid iteration, that allow developers to feel right at home while still targeting this IR that has, supports great analysis tools. Um, we also wanna make it easy for uh, developers to 
feed useful information into these analysis tools by allowing them to easily specify lots of validation constraints and logic directly in source code without having to learn a separate modeling language or a separate uh, set of specification tools. And our hope was that this would create a virtuous cycle where as developers add a little bit of extra constraints, the powerful tools we have make these very useful and encourage developers to add more and more constraints. And these constraints and additional specifications actually make the program easier for the developers to reason about at a high level. So we get this nice um, confluence of information being more and more useful as we go on. So without any more high level view, let's talk about what the Bosky language looks like. So here's a simple uh, program. It's a this function. So it's a function called abs that takes one variable and int, returns an int. And as you can see, it's got a nice familiar block structure. I can assign a variable multiple times in the flow. Uh, I can have conditional if statements and I'll just figure out the right sign and then multiply by that to get the absolute value. So it looks very familiar to most devs coming from a TypeScript or Python or you know, Go type programming language. Uh, we also use heavily things that you'd see coming from the functional space. So we have higher order functions. So all of takes a predicate that checks if something is greater than zero. We support rest and spread arguments um, like you'd be familiar with coming from JavaScript. So a lot of things that make it very easy to plumb things together quickly without writing a lot of boilerplate code. We also support uh, objects and what you would consider maybe mixing classes or traits as well as union types. So it's very easy to adjust your type system to model the particular domain you're in without having to build a very complex and touchy ontology. And then we support lots of nice things like switch as expression, null coalescing, early returns with errors, and all this stuff that you would expect if you were coming from a, a modern web language. So let's go into a demo and show kind of what this looks like in terms of some of the modeling code that we discussed earlier and how the tooling experience works. Okay. So for this demo, I wanna zoom in on a small portion of the code, the modeling code we were looking at uh, in Morphia written in Elm earlier and look at how a portion of it might look if you wrote it in, in Bosky. And in particular, this chunk takes some inflows as a list and some outflows as a list, performs some computation on them, returns the result, and from the spec, we can actually know as sort of a high level constraint that whatever the details of this computation are, that the return value should always be greater than or equal to zero. Now, what our tooling stack allows us to do and the, the nuances of the Bosky language, we can actually take this code as written and translate it into a logical model in first order logic that can be consumed by a solver like a SAT modulo theory solver um, and I can show the code here. As you can see, it's a little hairy. There's a lot of low level detail because of the exact logical encoding, but this actually captures every possible execution in a full precision of this code written here. And with that, we can go and run our solver and expand this and search for any possible input that would cause that assertion to fail. And as you can see, it found one where the list one contains the element zero and the list two contains the element negative one. And so if the first list contains the element zero, uh, this sum will be zero. And if the second list contains the element negative one, this sum will be negative one, the result will be negative one. And uh, sure enough, our insurers clause will be violated. So this found a, a counterexample that we can go and use to debug our model code, uh, just like if we had found a failing test case. Now we can fix this by actually pinning the result amount to zero, uh, which is the correct fix for this bug. And now if we go back and run our tester and don't ask it to generate a model because now it's gonna be correct, it will go, it will expand everything. It'll actually find a, a conflict set to prove that it is impossible for these inputs uh, with this computation to ever violate this output clause. So this is really exciting because it allows us to add some high level constraints or 
uh, verification conditions that we always want to hold to the code and be able to effectively check them and get more confidence and more assurance that our computations are satisfying the desired high level semantics. So now let's jump back to the slides and I'll show a little bit more about how things can be encoded, what types of things you can express in these assertions and what features the language has for making this easy to get these concepts in the right place in your code. Great, so now that we've seen how the BOSCI language in the tool chain allows you to insert uh, conditions and assertions to be checked and either fully verify them or symbolically generate a counterexample that shows a bug in your model, let's look a little bit more at the range of things that we allow you to specify. So for support, we wanted to make sure that it was very easy for developers to add these types of higher level semantic assertions and restrictions on what should be happening in the program uh, or their model. And so we wanted to introduce a bunch of constructs to make it very easy to insert these and not require a bunch of custom code to handle all of this. And we also wanted to avoid the common problem of having a separate modeling language or a proof language from the programming language. So in Bosky, the language that you write the assertions in is exactly the same as the Bosky programming language. And anything you can write in Bosky code can be included in assertion and can be checked at runtime, can be checked by the verifier, can be checked by the model checker, and can be checked by the tester. So this is all there and can be taken advantage of by all of the tooling. So we were very happy that we were able to make this completely transparent. We also have several places that you can add these assertions. So a common one is the pre and post condition, uh, as you saw in our example. And with all of these, we allow you to turn them on either always, if you want to make sure that this condition always holds at runtime and we'll throw an error if it fails, even in release, or if you only want to have them turned on for say your debug builds, or you only want them there for use by the verifier, you can always you can set the flags that enable or disable all of this. We also have data invariants, which are very powerful. So if you look at this, we have an entity or a class uh, called order. It has three fields named quantity and price. And the invariant guarantees that anytime one of these is constructed, the name will always be non-empty and the price will always be greater than or equal to zero. So that allows you to count on this invariant anytime you're using one of these types. And it prevents you from accidentally creating an invalid uh, object of this type. Now, interestingly, you'll notice quantity is not included in this invariant, and we would assume quantity always has to be greater than or equal to zero. But we wanted to make it as easy as possible to sort of have a lot of common conditions expressed in the type system as well. We'll talk more about this later, but this is one example where the quantity is declared as a natural number. So that actually guarantees that it's greater than or equal to zero, and we don't have to wait until we get to the verifier stage, we can actually check and catch errors around this in the type system. Finally, we support ad hoc uh, checks and asserts that you can put anywhere in your code for any condition that you wanna have verified or validated. And again, here this shows a slightly more complicated bit of code stuck in there where we're checking if uh, the name exists in a collection of existing orders before doing something. Right, so I wanna emphasize that, again, the assertion language is arbitrary Bosky code, not just simple inequalities or uh, order constraints. So uh, as I mentioned, we have more examples of these numeric types, which are very common things you wanna validate. And these are also known as unit types and we've borrowed them from other languages, but what it allows you to do is say, I have a specific uh, numeric type, in this case, decimal, and I want to make a derived type called US dollars or decimals and, or sorry, percents. And I want these to be distinct types with distinct operations. And I want the type checker to be aware of that. So for example, if I had a variable payment that was defined to be of type US dollars and I attempt to assign an arbitrary number to it, that's a type error. Now I can create a literal US dollar amount and assign that to it. And that's perfectly acceptable. We also, through operator overloading, allow you to build um, both overload custom built-in operators and define your own operators that allow you to do type safe operations on these values. So for example, multiplication, it doesn't make sense to multiply two US dollar amounts together, right? That's a type error. But if you wanna take 25% of an existing payment, 
this is a totally type safe computation and will succeed and will produce the expected type of US dollars. So this is a really powerful feature that allows us to easily create custom numeric types that behave in an absolutely type safe way. We can do verification on, we can use the type checker on, and it also makes your code much more understandable and auditable from a human perspective. Going further with this, um, we've introduced a new concept uh, previously undeveloped in Bosky called type strings. And we support two flavors of this. One of them is basically regex validated strings. So for example, I can declare a type called zip code, which takes five digits with an optional trailing four. And I can also create a type that has a parse operation with any custom logic in it. Now using these, I can say, I can declare a variable, variable string, uh, string of zip code. And if I attempt to sign it an arbitrary string okay, this will be a type error because okay is a string, but I wanted a type string of zip code. I can say, okay, I'm gonna declare some string called okay, a zip code string, but this will fail because it doesn't match the regex. In fact, the only one of these assignments that will be type safe and allowed by the compiler is the one where that zip code string actually is a valid formatted zip code. So this allows us to add a lot of rich semantic information to many interfaces that today would be typed as, it takes a string, a string, and a string, and now it's a string that is a username, a string that is a password, a string that is a resource requested, and we can actually expose that to the type checker, making the code more understandable by the human, but also lifting this information so that it's available for the verifier to do a much better job with. Uh, here with the, these uh, parsable strings, we can also do the type string literal construction, but it also gives us a way to do uh, string literal objects. So the parser allows you to take, say, a path at source test. It will construct a path object for you without you having to explicitly call a constructor. So it allows you to make this very transparent about what are literal object constructions without having to manually expand the, the constructor yourself. So uh, there's a lot more that we're doing in Bosky, both from the programming language feature side and from the tooling side, but I just wanted to give you a flavor of what's going on there um, and why we're excited and think this is really a new paradigm in the way the programming languages are built and software is developed. Like in particular, this co-design principle, um, the desire to make the code uh, transparent and easy to reason about both for automated purposes, but also that really helps humans as well with things like these unit types and type strings. And the way it builds a virtuous cycle between adding more and more value to these high level intentional semantic assertions by having the tools that can leverage them and then feed that information back to the developer. Uh, we're also really excited here working with Morphere and FinOS to sort of build on the polyglot capabilities that are in Morphere that don't restrict uh, us to having to build a full runtime ourselves. We can benefit a lot from all this framework that Morphere has always done. And we think it's really exciting to be able to work in this FinOS space where these high assurance models are very valuable um, and, and give us a chance to show the potential for these leading edge tooling and analysis scenarios. So I think that it concludes the set of things that I wanted to discuss. So I'll pass it back uh, to the next section. Thank you. Thanks so much, Stephen and Mark. This was great. I really appreciate you taking the time to be with us today. And thanks everyone for joining us today to, to hear about this panel. I'd like to echo something that Stephen said before we go, which is that um, regulations are complex, turning them into code is expensive, and more importantly, sharing the effort means that everybody wins. So come join us, check out Morphir and our other projects at github.com forward slash finos and get involved. Thank you so much and have a nice day. There you go. I'm double muted. Don't you love it? Um, we, we do have uh, Stephen and Mark on who can answer any questions from um, from the, the attendees. If you if there's anything 
uh, in particular you'd like to to ask? I, mean, I, I do have, uh, I, I, Stephen and, and Mark, do you want to say hello, put your video on, make sure that everybody can see you? Yeah, hello. Brilliant, thank you. Um, so I do have a question, a first question, while, while we give everybody else a chance to, to come up with theirs. But Stephen, can you talk a little bit, we just heard from Legend um, just before this, and, and, and obviously Rob uh, introduced and, and I identified that there were some synergies. Can you talk about any conversations that you've had about how the, the two uh, different systems might be able to interact in, in the future? Yeah, I think uh, one of the things we're really looking at is that Legend is a great platform for modeling data and data interaction and transformation. Um, and it's it's got a, a, a you know it's a fair amount of logic as well in terms of calculations and transformations. Uh, Morpher is very focused on the logic modeling aspect, and from logic modeling, you you need data modeling as well. Um, so it's it's certainly dependent on having good data models. So if you take the two together, I think you've got a, a very powerful um, potential platform. And so that's what we're we've been looking at. I think, um, yeah, I mean, I, th I think that's just a, it's a great example of these two innovations um, from what would normally be companies that don't um, work on innovations together. We can actually look at these together through the FinOS program, um, and it just makes a lot of sense. Great, thank you. Um, I have another one for you. Can you talk a little bit about how Morpher is used within Morgan Stanley? I mean, clearly there's the potential around RegTech um, and uh, and maybe some of your decisions around choosing to open source, um, you know, that code that was built in-house. Yeah, I mean, some of the, the things that we, we focus on are uh, increasing development efficiency. So uh, the idea is that you know, we all as developers like to think, or as application developers like to think our jobs are converting business problems into computer problems. Um, and then we realize that there's all this other stuff that we need to do in terms of, you know, regulatory requirements and, and you know, working with frameworks and complex things like concurrency, et cetera. Um, and so some of the things that we focus on are, are being able to holistically capture calculations and, and rules and then quickly turn that into running systems through cogeneration. Um, and I think that's where that's where the uh, the opportunity here lies. And when you look at something like Bosky that with all those advanced um, capabilities, then we can look at a, at a language and choose um, a language based on the capabilities and, and what we want them to do. Um, and then have those languages target the, the Morpher uh, intermediary language and then use that to then generate running systems. And so, you know, I think from a business perspective, uh, we, we tend to look at it in terms of calculations, um, rules like, you know, categorization and stuff like that, and being able to look at a system holistically, which is often difficult when you have logic peppered throughout the system. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and uh, Mark, if the, so you're in the research area of Microsoft and, and if, if people wanted to get involved with the Bosky language, um, how do they, you know, how do they go about doing that? You, you provided links before and, and what, what's, what are the areas of, of future development, um, maybe building on what you touched on earlier? Sure, sure. Yeah. So the, the GitHub page is where we've been doing all this work. And we've tried to keep this out in the open from the beginning. Um, you know, right now, we're still more in the uh, experimental phase. We've been doing a lot of prototyping, uh, rapid evolution of the language. And so this, this is one reason why it's been great to work with everybody on the Morphier team and really, you know, understand where our good ideas actually address the problems that they had and where some of our clever ideas maybe weren't actually that useful in practice. And so, you know, having, having their input and in, in, in that real world experience has been great in helping us uh, in some of these experiments. And so we, you know, welcome anybody who's interested in understanding either more from the theoretical side 
who wants to just try some of these things out, who we've had some people open some pull requests. So it's great to have some community contributions from the code. And um, so at this point, we've, we've reached uh, hopefully a bit of a steady state where we've got a lot of the features that actually turn out to be useful. We've nailed down most of the things that we need to do for this verification tooling. And we're really trying to step it up and get to the point where we can integrate effectively with Morphia and start providing some of the, the, the value that we'd like to the overall project. And this is where it's great that they've set up this sort of collaboration page for us or uh, GitHub repo for us with the FinOS to start doing some of this integration in the not too distant future. Great, thank you. Um, we do have a, a question that's just come in. Um, what compiler does Bosque use? And can you enforce catch specific regulations at compile time without being explicit? Uh, so can you catch specific regulations with W? Well, let me start at the beginning. So um, the compiler we use, I mean, that's been part of the language development process. We converted into this intermediate representation, which today we just compile to C++ for easy interop with everything. Uh, this is one of the great things about Morphia is we wanted to basically live in this polyglot language environment that sort of dominates modern development environments. So if we're able to plug into their IR, we automatically play nicely with everybody else. Um, the, as far as things you can check, check automatically in the compiler and the verifier. Uh, you know, pretty much any language feature that comes up, like we'll verify array out of bounds in uh, accesses, integer overflows if you want, uh, any sort of these primitive operations that can go wrong. If you're a JavaScript developer, you know, undefined is not a function. We can check for anything like that would, that would pop up. Uh, but then also, like I said, we really wanted to make it easy for you to add logic that was specific to your problem area. Um, and sort of these high level things like, you know, sanity checks about uh, values being positive or not creating invalid object types, particularly if you're dealing with one of these systems that's communicating across RESTful APIs with databases, with other data stores, with arbitrary web services, data is coming in, it's very easy to have these sort of parsing and validation errors. So we wanted to make that easy to have this data validation layer right at the front that we can do extensive checking on and make sure that the rest of your code is going to be protected from um, the, the kinds of problems that can pop up there. Uh, hopefully that answered the question. If it didn't, I'm happy to go in a little more detail on something. Uh -huh. Thank you. Um, it's not as easy as you'd potentially like to, to enable um, attendees to speak, but there's, uh, so if there's, oh, it was great. <laughs> so, so thank you. Um, another question, is Bosky supported through Visual Studio Code? Uh, that is one of our to-do items. We have a, a basic add-in that gives you syntax highlighting support. Uh, as you saw in the demo, we, you know, all the tooling runs through the command line now. We'd like to hook it up to have a very nice, integrated environment. So this checking just becomes a routine part of your workflow. And really you're like, hey, it's easy for me to add an assert. It gets automatically checked. I get all this great value, you know, feedback value from it. So I just want to enrich the, the specifications and come up with a very, you know, the end product is something I'm very confident in its correctness and that it matches the, the underlying business logic intent. Um. Great. Uh, here's another one. Um, many organizations currently use rules engines to capture business rules. How do Morfer and Bosky compare to those? Um, who wants to take it first? I'll let you go first, Stephen. Okay. Yeah, I'll go first. So um, I think one aspect of rules engines is that they capture individual rules and less so holistic rules. Um, and I think, you know, rules engines are, are really geared at giving users a kind of access to, to creating rules and then kind of running them undeterministically, um, which is very different than, than you would find in say like a regulation where it's very precise and you, you, can't, you can't really run it like that. 
Um, and that's where the developer provides a lot of value. So that's one big aspect. And then I think the other big aspect of rules engines is that um, they, they tend to dictate the runtime environment. So they, they control the rule creation and then the rule execution. Um, and so in doing that, you're locking yourself into a, a bit of technology, which when we're talking about regulations, again, we, we want to avoid that. We want to uh, be as open as possible to different um, runtime contexts. So I think those are two major differences between a rules engine and then codifying rules, but then generating um, execution out of that. Yeah, and I think I want to echo this, you know, a rules engine or even codified rules, you have each rule written independently, and then you hope that the, all of those implementations of the individual rules ensure that the intended specification and behavior of the overall system is correct. And I think a big push of Bosky is to allow you to specify in the same code some of this high level intent and then be able with the verify verification tooling to connect those individual rules to those high level intents and make sure something wasn't lost in the, in the intermediate translation or the yeah, development there. And I, I'll, I'll finalize that um, anything you can do with a rules engine, I mean, a rules engine is a nice UI over programming in the end, I think. Um, and you can, you can basically accomplish the same thing and then have those rules compiled down to, uh, to code that's, that's very precise rather than, as Mark mentioned, very um, isolated. So you can get the same kind of user effect of users can manage rules without them knowing about the intricacies of programming languages, if you wanna get into that kind of UI. Uh, thank you, I, I hope that answers the question. If not, feel free to pop another one into the Q&A. Um, there's another another question feeding on a little bit from, from some of the earlier conversation. How open are Marfor and Bosque Bosk maintainers, so <laughs> you guys, uh, amongst others, um, for accepting pull requests from the wider open source community? And you know, I, I know Mark, you've answered this a little bit, uh, and Stephen, maybe you want to touch upon too what um, what different uh, types of um, skills you need to have, or or different experiences in order to be able to uh, valuably contribute. So yeah, there well, is the, the first question is about openness uh, to accepting those pull requests. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think this is a, a good time to add it on the Morpher side that um, it's really a, a community driven. Um, and, and the reason that we, we open sourced it from Morgan Stanley was that we realized that the community could provide more value um, than a closed source system all right i think um what we've seen is that when people kind of get to the concepts of of automation and, and co-generation and in that that it opens up a different level of um of innovation um and so we're, we're hoping that with the community we get that same level of innovation um and contribution so we're totally open that was the whole reason that we open sourced it and then the finos model itself is very open um, I think it's it's very easy to 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 be able to. I mean, it's just one, you know, CLA, and then you're enabled to uh, contribute. So, and, and then in terms of what kind of skills, um, basically anything. I mean, from from the documentation to to um, you know, very complex uh, programming language theory, uh, and anything in between. Yeah, uh, you know, from the from the Bosky side, we we're academics, so we love to share and learn together, and that's that's the best way to do it. So that, we we wanted to start open from the beginning, and uh, you know, thus far, it, most of our contributors have been other academics, and the model has been they've been more forked off the project, done some independent research on it, and then the you know share back has been publications or their learnings from this. Um, you know, we've also have a number of people who have uh, had smaller contributions, documentation, bug fixes, feedback on language features in the GitHub repository. And those have all been phenomenal as well, particularly for identifying some design choices in the language that were, were not ideal. 
it's been a little challenging for sort of the more traditional uh, contributions just because we've been in such a rapid state of, of churn and change and experimentation. But, uh, you know, hopefully, as I said, we're, we're over the big hump on that. And, you know, it, it'd be great if people are interested in, you know, compilers, type checkers, all that sort of stuff, you know, we'd love that. We also love people who come in and just give some feedback on trying to build uh, a couple hundred lines, 500 line project and how it worked and what didn't work and, uh, you know, open some, some, some bugs. That's awesome as well. So we're very open to everything, you know, as if you want to do something as advanced as, uh, you know, write a paper as part of your PhD thesis to, I found a bug uh, and I just wanted to let you know about it. We love all of that. That's great. Thank you. And, and, and that really does, I think, epitomize, um, our community that that sense of openness and and real desire to collaborate and that that's why you open sourcing's in the first place right um and and i would just add that within the uh open reg tech initiative that that, that i mentioned that finos launched earlier in the year we've had um you know a number of opportunities to present um to present this to regulators and with uh we're actually quite pleased and surprised with the openness um, that we've had in, in response. You know, there, there are some, we think of regulators and, and rightly so being um, somewhat closed off and maybe not as advanced in technology uh, as, as um, you know, some other members in the industry, but we have been pleasantly surprised at the, um, you know, the willingness and, and actually the, the desire to make changes. You know, earlier, um, Ian was mentioning also the the digital regulatory reporting and and I, I think that you know using these open tools and this transparency to um, you know much better to in much better ways define what those implementations are instead of running through the you know six thousand pages of the text as as you as you showed Stephen um, and and validate the implementations and so we are really optimistic that um, through projects like this and the initiative. Um, and the openness that we're seeing from the regulars to explore how this can be, um, you know, how they can leverage this work that, that um, we'll make some strides there too. Um, are there any other questions or any closing thoughts that you have? Nope, fair enough. Um, so thank you, Stephen and Mark, uh, very much, and and Aitana um, for your time and, and contribution as well. And um, I think James is going to introduce our next panel. Um, James, do you want to? There he is. Uh, hey. Mark and Stephen, thanks again. Thank you very much. That's amazing. Thank you very much to the Morpha team um, for their insightful. Um, panel discussion this afternoon. Um, so for those who didn't see my talk earlier, I'm James McLeod, Director of Community at FINOS. Um, and I have the great pleasure of introducing our next talk this afternoon. Um, so I'd like to introduce you to Paul Graves, um, Senior Vice President and Lead Technical Architect at City, um, and Andrew Carr, uh, Head of Consulting for Scott Logic in Bristol. Um, and I've had the great pleasure of working uh, with both the Data Hub and Data Helix project teams over the last um, year um, on creating kind of like synergies between the two projects, which I'm pretty sure um, both um, Paul and Andrew are going to talk through today. So, Paul, it's over to you. Thank you. Great. Thanks, James. Um, can you hear me? OK, just check the microphone's working. You are good. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, great. So yes, uh, so hi, I'm Paul Groves. Uh, I work over at City Group as an architect in the client onboarding space. And um, throw it over to Andrew. You can say hello. Hello. So I'm Andrew Carr. I'm head of consultancy for the Bristol Scott Logic office. Awesome. Cool. So um, oh, let me get that working. Right. So um, Data Hub. Uh, that was a contribution that Citigroup we made as our first contribution to Finos earlier in the year. Um, very briefly, uh, Data Hub is a synthetic data generator. We support two modes of operating, which is you can kind of handcraft your own rules, or you can use production, or you can use like existing data sets. Data Hub can analyze it, produce like a statistical model out of it, and then it can use that for um, synthetic generation. 
to try and preserve privacy. Um, so kind of support these kind of two things. Um, now, Data Hub, it's largely what we've done there is we've brought lots to, uh, together, lots of different kind of open source um, existing libraries together and try to make a very you know seamless, consistent interface across them. So yeah, there's lots and lots of tooling out there, but the problem was there's a lot of time you had to spend to try and bootstrap these projects up. And so we've decided to give it all a bit of a consistent interface. And then we've done a bit of our own work as well on top of that as well. Um, so that's kind of Data Hub, what it is. And I guess, Andrew, Data Helix. Yeah, so D Data Helix, I guess, came from uh, a slightly different point of view. We tried to build a tool uh, to start with to, to mostly be used by our testers uh, to be able to generate test data really quickly. So uh, the aim was hopefully without coding, they could write a config file uh, which described the rules of the data and, and then run the tool to, um, to, to generate some data. So similar field to um, Data Hub, but actually uh, a different use case, which I, I'll, I'll get onto a bit later. So um, essentially what we ended up doing is um, having a, um, a system that described this own language, which is what you're seeing on the, the screen right there, which is a data helix profile. Uh, and this is a playground that you can you can find on, on Finos. Uh, and if you modify the, um, the profile, data profile on the left, and then you press run, then it will show you some sample generated data. Uh, and, and it really is, the, the idea is, uh, to, to satisfy the use case of generating large volumes of data quickly for doing load testing uh, or, or stuff like that, um, where um, it would just simply take you a, you know, a decent bit of coding to, to write your own data. So next slide, please, Paul. Oh, right. Um, so synthetic data, um, I guess, you know, what is it? There's been a lot of talk about it recently and it's all a bit mysterious, I think. Um, so really simply put synthetic data is anything that you can algorith algorithmically generate and there's lots and lots of different ways that can be done lots of different kind of um applications for synthetic data so you can go back to things like the oil and gas industry the medical industry you know government statistics they all heavily use uh synthetic data approaches and then i think probably a bit more mundane us over in finance we tend to look towards synthetic data for data privacy um so you know taking production data or as um, Andrew's just said, you know, just generating test data from a bunch of algorithms and other inputs. Um, so largely with synthetic data, there's two broad approaches. That's that kind of defining your own rules and uh, you, know, you know, understand the domain, you understand the constraints of the application and all the data, and then you essentially handcraft those rules and you just generate a whole load of data. Um, and then yes, there's a second one where we do the data analysis. So we, we try and do use um, you know, a bunch of statistical analysis. Um, there's lots of different ways it can be done. Particularly GANs are a big area of research and a lot of commercial products are now using GANs to analyze production data, you know, work out the distributions and then use that kind of statistical model to then forward generate the data out of that. So it's not particularly a new thing. It's something that I think that there's been just an increasing amount of talk about it as well. Um, so a bit of history. I think, um, you know, if we looked at, what we think of synthetic data now it actually probably started back in the in the 90s with the u.s census bureau and they had a problem where they wanted to um get the they had kind of a couple of problems one is not all the census data is complete you know people might partially incomplete the, uh, the forms there might be a lot of missed you know households wouldn't even respond so they wanted a way to statistically populate the missing data with um kind of with what they would thought would be good data and that's what we kind of think we often now use things like machine learning for. Um, so they came, came up these statistical model approaches to do that. Now, the other thing they wanted to do was they wanted to give out the data sets in a safe way. So redaction had a lot of problems where you could essentially re-identify people pretty quickly. So they wanted to take their big US census data. They wanted to then transform that into a, mo into a same data set that was publicly shareable and you had no risk of re-identification. So um, that was kind of their, their idea. And there was a whole load of techniques that they came up with in the 90s to do that. Um, and so that's where a lot of the work comes from now. Um, more interestingly, or more fun, if anybody is in their 40s and used to have a BBC Micro or Spectrum, you'll probably recognize this, uh, Elite. So this was the whole procedural generation route. And what they were trying to do with the Ape Elite was they had very limited resources tiny amounts of memory but they wanted to create an entire like galaxy of you know 256 planets eight galaxies that you could 
travel around. And they wanted to make it seem very, very realistic um, and really kind of give you this immersive experience. So they went down this approach of actually doing procedural generation. Um, and they had a very couple of very small data sets. It was like a couple of like string lookup tables. The whole thing would have taken like a couple of bytes of memory, the, the actual data they needed. But what they could do was consistently then generate this entire galaxy on demand as it was required from that very, very small input set. And that would create this kind of little galaxy of planets that will be with all their unique properties. And that's really what um, procedural generation is about. Um, and again, Elite back in 1984, while it, you know, lots of things had been using procedural generation for then, it was probably the first time we really saw somebody do procedural generation and make this kind of real life-like immersive experience. Um, so that's kind of, you know, a little bit of a history about where we come from. Um, so yeah, since I say it's nothing particularly new, but there has been, it has been coming up quite a lot. There's been a lot of new vendors coming up around in this space as well. And I think that's for two reasons. One is we've had all the GDPR and data protection. And I think a lot of us, we've all gone down this same route of trying to do the data redaction, data renormalization, and that's quite an expensive process. And often I think the, the results have been a bit unsatisfactory, like, um, particularly once you, you know, redaction, we've all had the problems with re-identifying re data. And if you're not anonymization, quite often you end up with this, just this massive ball of redacted fuzz that has no use in your test systems at all. Um, <clears throat> also, there's been quite a bit of interest from machine learning and AI. So how do you create realistic events, generate realistic events for your, um, not for your training of the model, but for your kind of your backend engineering data pipeline. So how do you get seemingly realistic data <clears throat> into your into your kind of AI uh, ML kind of pipelines that you could be doing your development with? Uh, of course, you would still always use the uh, real data to train your model, but you know that kind of bit before it. Um, I think some good examples are, say you're doing um, your AI process or your ML processes need some new data tagging and that tagging is not been done yet, uh, but your modelers need a bunch of data to start working with while other changes have been happening to try and you know do that tagging process. Now as you kind of separate that out a little bit as well, you know, generate some data up front that you might not actually have access to. Um, so yes, uh, reduction, anonymization, and synthesis. Uh, when it comes to data privacy in um, kind of your development systems, these are your three approaches. Reduction, simply remove the sensitive information. Uh, so, you know, customer names, um, you know, social security numbers, all those usual bits. Anonymization is a fuller process where you're not just redacting, but you're in, you've got to make sure that there's no way to re-identify um, out of that redacted data set back to a, a real person. And that's actually quite a complicated process. Or we go down to synthesis. And as we said, there's two synthesis ways. You do a completely procedural based, uh, handcraft it, or we use the existing data sets. Um, so when we talk about redaction and re-identification risk, this is a very simple example. Um, you know, you could take a data set, say it's your HR database, and you've got, you know, people's um, sensitive information on, on religion in there, like salary and other, and other things, you know, disciplinary, whatever. So if you just went through and just removed people's names and maybe just took a few other fields out, and then you put that into your test system, you it wouldn't take a genius to prickly, pretty much quickly work back out who the people were uh, from you know other information that's internally available like your address book particularly because if you've got something who's like their uh, the department they're in and their um even just simply the department they're in and their corporate title quite often you might only have one person one corporate title in a department so that's a really easy thing to just go and re-identify all that information again um that's a very very simple example there's been a lot of case studies into re-identification and um, you need it's, it's uh, you only need like a couple of attributes often to be able to go back and re-identify. Um, and that's where we get into this area called differential privacy. And the, the point of differential, it's, we could probably spend hours talking about this, but the, the basic idea of differential privacy is it should be mathematically impossible to um, take a uh, statistical set of data and then backwards work out back down to original individuals again. That should just it um, should be impossible. Um, so actually, differential privacy it's kind of quite firmly rooted in cryptography, and so we might just try and stay away from this subject a bit today because we'll just go off on a tangent a little bit. But um, differential privacy, if you're doing data analysis to then use do synthetic generation, it's it's kind of quite a key thing in there. It's very important. 
Um, how are we doing for time? Uh, yeah, so if you look at like a typical kind of synthetic data flow, you'll start with your production. No, you've got kind of two bits. You've got the stuff that you need to do in your production environment, and then the stuff that happens in your non-production environment. So you might start with, you know, in your production environment, you need to get your data out. So you query your data, you kind of do a basic bit of redaction, make sure the PI attributes are kind of removed. And then you'll do a bunch of data analysis on that and then produce some kind of statistical model, like a, your differential privacy file. And that's normally a big, aggreg a big aggregation and a bunch of statistics about the data it's seen, you know, relationships deserved, uh, correlations and whatnot. Um, so now you've got that file and it should be clean of all PII. You shouldn't be able to go back with that file and re-identify anybody. It's just a big statistical model of that data. So what we can do is we can take that, then we can do synthetic processing over the top of it to then generate back at, generate back out all the row level information. And then we can add back in PII-like attributes. So not the real PII attributes, um, like somebody's real name, but we can then you know, generate fake name, fake addresses, and fill in all those blanks that we, we've, those, those bits we redacted out as well. And then we can write that to a product database. So hopefully what we've got then is in our non-production database, we should have a whole load of row level data that looks like the real data, but it's no way to ever, it feels like the real data, it feels realistic, it feels you know, immersive um, and whatnot. Um, and it should be decent quality and it should obey all the rules that were observed in the production data. So that's kind of, that's the, if you've got an existing data set available. Or we have the opposite route, which is there's no data available or you kind of don't want to use it and you just go for straight procedural generation, which is fill up a hands craft a bunch of rules, you produce a whole load of data, you put it in your data, the data store. So it's quite simple. But obviously there's more time consuming to do this. Your, develop, your person who's authoring those rules is gonna have to have a much better understanding of the data, the constraints, the rules of the data, and we'll have to have much more innate knowledge about it to be able to do that. So cool, I think that's a hopefully a very brief uh, view of synthetic data. Um, I guess over to you, Andrew. Cool. Yeah, so um, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about uh, the typical use cases uh, for synthetic data and I guess uh, how they impact procedural generation. So as Paul mentioned, uh, there are a few different approaches. Obviously, taking uh, normal data and then anonymizing and redacting it has its challenges. Uh, I think I'm not sure, but I suspect Paul's probably going to chat about that later. Certainly, one of the issues with doing that is you can end up with data that's in no way useful. You redact it and anonymize it so much to the point where it's not actually useful in, in terms of fitness for purpose. And I do think when, um, I guess Paul and I have found certainly uh, being involved with this FinOS data generation, we've ended up having lots of conversations with people about uh, their use cases that they're using synthetic data for. And the more you talk, you begin to realize that actually the solutions for synthetic data, it really depends upon the use case that you're trying to solve. So for example, um, if you're looking for kind of lower volume, highly accurate uh, data to test your functionality, you're probably going to go for a very different solution than different the other use cases, which are more like your kind of high volume, reasonably shaped data and reasonable accuracy, uh, which you might be just doing something to do a, like a load test, or if you're actually using some high volume data that you want it to be statistically accurately shaped uh, because you're going to be using it for uh, modeling uh, machine learning, analytics, et cetera, et cetera. Paul, can you go to the, the next slide, please? So I guess depending on which case um, you're considering, um, I'm going to go through a, a simple case uh, and, and demonstrate why the rules-based approach is really good if you're going for, I guess, the kind of load-based testing where you want the data to look reasonable. It doesn't have to be that accurate, uh, but you want to generate the, the data really quickly. and then uh, you know, a tool like the Data Helix, and there's there's a there's a number of them out there, um, where you can just use a config file to to modify the rules can be a good approach for that. But I guess it's not such a good approach uh, when the data you want needs to be highly accurate, and you need it either for uh, I guess functional testing, or you need it to be you know statistically valid shape where you're probably not going to want to go down a different route. Cool. If you can hit the next slide, so let's let's consider a, a really simple use case. Um, so like I said, the, the kind of <coughs> low volume, highly accurate data, let's see what we can do. So imagine you define the test data as um, a really simple, and this is just five columns. This is a massively simplified example, but it's just really 
illustrate how complex the rules can, can get really quickly, even to get data that on first pass looks reasonable. So if we have some sort of trade ID, a stock ID, uh, whether that's a RIC code or QSIP or, or, or ISIN or whatever, uh, a stock name, uh, some sort of price. And again, I'm simplifying it so we're not, not including currency and, and all the things that you, you typically do actually need to include to be useful uh, and, and the trade date time. So if we hit the next slide, so if we if we just literally defined, uh, we needed the fact that we needed uh, like an ID, another ID, uh, a name, a price, and a trade date, and we just let a generator go off using even you know some really basic modeling would clearly get nonsense data, and and so from a uh, you know I suspect from a load point of view this wouldn't even be that useful because uh, the stock ID is probably the wrong uh, size, it probably doesn't contain the typical characters that stock ID contains uh, the price uh, clearly uh, contains the wrong number of decimal places. If you're doing a load test with this, I suspect while this might have some use, it would probably have negligible use. Um, so it's not really, uh, it's definitely not usable for functional testing. It's probably not usable for volume testing and it's definitely not suitable for machine learning or statistical analysis of anything. We go to the next slide. So now if we want to get a little bit more specific, um, we can certainly go for uh, enumerations, for example, in the stock ID, and then go for enumerations in the stock name, and then we define a little bit more uh, the range that we want the price. Again, these could all be rules. The language we use uh, is, I guess, immaterial. Um, and if we put a little bit more rules around the date time, as again, we say it's, I don't know, greater than a week ago or, or less than today. Again, even with these sets of rules, if we head to the next slide, we can see that while the data looks on first pass a little bit more sensible, it doesn't take us more than a second to quickly realize that the stock ID and the stock name don't match, which, which quickly brings you to the conclusion that you really need to do dependencies between the columns. So for any row of data, if uh, one of the columns is one value, you probably want to narrow down uh, the field of, of values of the other columns. And in particular, in this case, we're all aware that the stock ID and the stock name clearly need to match or we're just generating data that doesn't really make much sense. Now, for volume testing, that might be okay, depending on the situation, but possibly not. But for functional testing, it's clearly not gonna be useful. And it's definitely, again, not gonna be useful for machine learning or any form of statistical analysis. So if, if we go to the next slide and try and tighten the rules up a little bit again, um, we can do dependencies between uh, the columns and say, okay, the uh, stock name has to line up with the stock ID, Either you could have some sort of if, or you could have some sort of enum where they, they say they line up or however you wish to do it. You could add a bit further, say the float price needs to be two decimal places. And then if you go to the next slide and try and generate again. Okay, so it's starting to look a little bit more sensible in that the stock ID and the stock names now line up, but clearly the price is swinging all over the place. Um, so this might start to get to the point where it's useful for volume testing, where it kind of looks okay enough. Uh, but clearly for, for functional testing um, and um, uh, machine learning analysis, it, it's, it's not enough. And, and this has been a really simple situation where we're just getting started and getting the, the, the data anywhere close enough uh, to be useful for volume testing. Um, we did, uh, I guess, for, for projects I've been on just involved with recently, we were looking at a situation where um, we had a table of, of trades where the trades had 140 columns and uh, in terms of the rules-based approach, you needed about 3,000 rules to get the data to look accurate enough to do volume testing on. And even then it wasn't accurate enough, I guess, to do functional testing. So I guess I hope I've demonstrated even in a small way how quickly these rules can build up. Um, but it definitely gets to the point very, very quickly where you need a very large volume of rules um, uh, to get accurate. And, and, and going forward, if we head to the next slide, um, if we if we start to look for a, a more complex situation than trade, so we've gone for the a really simple situation. If you consider something like a bank account uh, generating data for that, you can clearly see that you're going to need start to need dependencies between the rows as well, and also uh, some sort of state, because you're going to typically expect salary to come out of uh, the same day every month. Uh, you're going to expect the same uh, big outgoings every month, like rent. You're not going to expect that to be some variable that, that massively varies all over the place. Um, you're going to also hope that the outgoings are, are less than the incomings. Um, 
and also you're going to want the amounts to be realistic such as if people get coffee at pre on weekdays when we used to go to offices and stuff um, and also you kind of want the number of uh, realistic events uh, to be realistic so you know you're not going to want someone to go to prep 300 times in one on monday and then once on tuesday so um, i guess what i'm trying to get across here is just the more complex and the more accurate the data has to get and certainly when you're leaning towards functional testing or statistical analysis you really need to start looking at either a different approach which isn't a rules-based approach um, or you need to just add so many rules as to the, the point of uh, it's almost going to be as complex as the business logic of the application itself Okay, next slide. Yeah, so I guess this is just a summary. So if you're looking for volume testing and the data has to look sensible, uh, a rules-based approach, approach can work. Uh, if you want super accurate data for functionality testing and validation, um, you're gonna have to probably get involved in doing your own coding and development because the complexity of, of the rules are probably gonna be such that it would need to be as complex as the application or close to it to be able to generate the data, the data properly. But if you're looking for data which is the right shape, uh, as Paul mentioned, you can use one of the techniques that either uses machine, machine learning or, or something else to look at the data, uh, extract the shape, and then generate data which is uh, of a very similar shape that you've seen. Next slide, Paul. I think this is my slide, actually. Sorry, uh, so... Um, a couple of examples of some of the things that we've been using synthetic for. So uh, particularly in client onboarding, how do we generate kind of realistic onboarding events? There's, you know, it's very heavily workflow based. So there's a lot of um, complexity in those workflows. Um, you know, only certain steps in workflows occur with, you know, particular client types and the rest. So yeah, that's one big thing that we kind of we started with this problem on. Um, things like generating risk in PNL with realistic sets of values. So that's just kind of big volume data. The constraints of the data is relatively simple. Um, then we also have things like synthetic generating portfolios of trades. So um, you know, just creating portfolios of swaps, for example. Um, credit card payments between merchant card holders and um, one of the main reasons we've all seen this is enabling easier relationships with vendors and cloud providers when we're trying to you know, have that exploratory first part before all the NDAs get signed and you know, all that complicated stuff. Um, like, you know, if we've got a truly public data set, which kind of describes our problem, you know, that's much easier to hand over. Um, so that's kind of the kind of some of the examples uh, that we've been kind of looking at and using. And I think onto the next slide. Um, so onto Data Hub itself, where hopefully we'll give a bit of a demo and nothing will break. Um, so Data Hub, relatively, it's a Python library. Um, now, that's to say, we're heavily based on things like that of Pandas data frames. So what we do with Data Hub is we just return back data frames back to you. What you do with that data frame, if you want to go and populate a database, put into a CSV file, uh, that's kind of outside of the scope of Data Hub. There's, there's plenty of other Python libraries out there that will handle you know populating databases with data frames for you so that's why we kind of sat around with pandas and got we didn't really go down the whole data syncing area but yeah just you type pip install data hub core and um after a couple of minutes um of all the dependencies going down you should be get going so i won't do that now because it will it will take a couple of minutes we'll use a an existing thing i've just set up so first of all just going to quickly show you how to boost um you know boost up a project up and handcraft a couple of rules, generate, say, some client data. So if I tab out and over to here, so take that out first. So move that out of way. So what's going on here? Let me maximize that up. So we're simply called, we've just imported Data Hub here. Um, it's all Python based. And the way we script the rules, again, it's all kind of in Python. So um, we're very much in the Python ecosystem. So we call like a, a data hub generates and we give it some properties, like some descriptions of the attributes that we want to generate. So at the moment we're just saying, create me a field called region and pick one of these values and use these weightings and give me a hundred of them. And we've got a fixed seed number here. So we use a fixed seed number Every time you generate it, you'll get the same data back each time. So if we were to remove that completely, it would be completely random each and every time. So we also allow for consistent generation as well. 
So if we, if I just save that, for example, let me comment that out as well, it's just gonna be useful later. And we, we run that. You can see we basically get uh, a list of 100 regions and they're just uh, varying. So um, yeah, it should all match the weightings that we've seen. Let's go head back over. Now let's say we want a country field. So we've got a we've got a client and it's in a region and now we want to put that client in a particular country. So we can do something called gen dot country codes. So it's an inbuilt. Actually, regions are inbuilt as well, but so are that was just to illustrate. So we can generate some country codes. Now, what's going to happen? Let me change that to twenty actually, and then we run it. Uh, right, so you can see again, we've got it here and now we've got this very ugly object in there, a country object, which doesn't look very nice for you here. So let's go back and we're going to do a bit of post-processing to just get the alpha free code of that country. So that's what that line of code is doing. We go back and run that. And now we've got a, um, we've got the country alpha free code. Uh, very quickly, you're going to go, this is rubbish. You know, we've got country Poland, and we said it's in North America. We've got India in North America, India in APAC. It's, it's clearly uh, not very good. So what we do in DataHub is we kind of understand things like regions and countries and currency codes. So what we can do here is we can give it a constraint. We can go region field equals region. And this generation function uh, will understand that constraint that we're putting in to so, you know, pick a country. Now, if we run that again, uh, it should look a lot better now. So now, nah, USA, North America, Australia in a, is in APAC, Ukraine is in EMEA, and so, and so on, it's all good. So if we add a few more bits and pieces, so let's pick an industry. And so you don't watch me type stuff out, I'm just going to go and steal from a, a another. So let's go, Back. So we want like an industry type and a um, comma in there and a SIP code for this client that we're making up. And again, uh, there's just a bit of post processing because these are actually objects and there's lots of different um, elements you can in that object that we can do. So to keep the rendering nice in my screen, let's just add that post processing back. Now we render that now. Uh, oh, I need to fix that. Ooh, ah, that's why it's sit code. Let's do that. Sorry, let me run that again. Now we've got a little bit more. So we're saying we've got a region, a country, now we've got industry, so mining, and then a particular kind of element within mining. So this is just using all the public um, standard industry code information that's out there. So again, Data Hub kind of knows these, um, knows much of these standards that are in there. And then very lastly, let's go and generate a legal entity name. So go steal that again and give this thing a name. So we're going to generate a legal name for that company and it's going to be specific to the industry and the country that's in. So we're going to give it these extra parameters. Say, look, there's this, that's where you can find the industry code for it and this is the country it's in. So again, we can name things um, accurately depending on the country. Uh, and the industry. Again, let's go in and run that one more time. And it's, here we go. So now we've got our region, country, industry, uh, we've got the SIT code, and then we've got a, a name. So, you know, here we've got company in finance, uh, Mordu, which is Mordu Bank is a loan correspondent. And we've called it like Holdy Loans Group, for example. Um, there's a construction here, here called, that's a, actually a bit of a horrible name. But you see, we kind of try, we kind of generate appropriate names for uh, for that kind of industry and country. And lastly, if we go back, let's go and get some numeric numbers. And there's all sorts of ways we can handcraft how we want these numbers to look. So, at the moment, we're just going to do it very simply. Just pick me a random number between these two points. But there are distributions that we do. We can say, look, use a normal distribution, particularly around a particular with a particular um, standard deviation. Um, so we've got all those kind of you know, normal distributions that you'll find. Um, so assets under management and estimated value. Um, let's just do that, for example. 
and run it again. And now you can see we've got the AUM and EV that I've done over here, just random, randomly generated. So that's kind of how we can quickly handcraft rules together and get very quickly a reasonable looking data set. Um, now, if we head back over to the slides, the other one was like, well, how do we do analysis of data? So I'm not gonna run this live because it can be a little bit slow and I think probably got better things at the time than watching a, an hour clock uh, hourglass tick by. So what we can do here is this very first line that you're seeing up here called analyze.run. So um, we're gonna give it an input data set or CSV file and we're gonna ask it to output like this model file that's done. And then we tell it a little bit about the data set, the bits of it that we're interested in. So uh, essentially, what are the discrete values and what are the continuous values? So we say the discrete values are region, country, zip code, industry, uh, and so on. And then we say the continuous values in there are AUM and EV. And there's a bunch of other bits and pieces that we can do. There's different kinds of analysis modules. So there's one which is called the fast bucketing model, which um, runs very, very quickly um, and generates data, I would say, of reasonable quality. Um, we can go into that maybe later and go into how that works if people are interested. Um, but there's also things like we integrate CTGAN. Um, there's another one um, called SDV. Uh, and there's a couple of other models as well. So there's another one that use, uses like linear regression, for example. Um, so there's different kind of models that we can plug into this to do the analysis. And then they all basically output this a file. What we then can do is we can then write another function, which is then generate the data. So we're going to call the gen.generate from model. We're going to set it what the model is. So we call this, we're going to use this fast bucket model. And we are going to um, supply this model file.json in there. And then what we can do is remember, if we go back to that slide earlier, where we said about adding back in like PII attributes, like things like names and addresses, what we can do here is, is in this properties area, we, is, is we can add back in like a name and we can tell it about where it will find the particular in, the bits it needs to generate that name in, in the data set itself that it's generating. And then we can basically redecorate the data with these PII attributes that should have been stripped out. So if you notice over in this analyze.run, we're not, we don't put any kind of, we only put the elements in that we actually want to do the analysis on, but we want to fit to the distributions. We don't put things like um, people's names in there, social security numbers, bank account numbers, all of that you add back in afterwards. So if we go, if we remember back in that earlier picture, this generate model function, that's what we'll be running on against our production data. And then this second function generate, that's what we'll be running in our development environment to actually produce the data and then do something with it. And like I said, you end up with a pandas data frame. So you can easily just call data frame two CSV. And there's plenty of like things like for populating Oracle databases with data frames in there as well. So that's pretty much what data hub does. Um, it's a pretty pluggable model. Uh, we're constantly trying to generate more and more models and refine these models. Um, now, I went through the differential privacy thing at the moment. Uh, we haven't signed it off yet as some of these models has been able to do full differential privacy. Getting kind of close, but there's a, a lot of legwork that we need to still do just to be able to actually make that claim um, that, that it's done. So that's something that we're trying to really aim, aim to get done. Um, also, data hub's incredibly easy to extend. It's just Python. So if we wanted if we wanted our own generation function that was unique to us, that you quickly wasn't part of data hub, you can literally just write these couple of lines of code here. Uh, you need two functions. One's a partial function. So this is this is a extension we're doing, which is going to just say hello and a name or something. So again, we you see we put the region in, put the country in. Do the, we do the name, so we're going to generate a person's name. We're going to make this extra attribute called message, and we're going to call this little extension function we just wrote here. Um, and so what we'll get there is the data set should be saying, hello, Paul, hello, Bill, hello, Jennifer, and so on. Whatever that name is, that will, we'll see it in that message. So that's, uh, that's how it's quite easy to extend um, the, the functions there. Um, so, uh, I guess what's next for data hub and data helix? And Andrew, chip in here if you want to. Um, so we're we're going to start merging these two together. So we're particularly interested in 
um, the spec language that Data Helix has. So how can we use that in Data Hub as well? So it's much easier to probably just write a quick JSON file than it is to get down into Python. So if uh, anyone's adverse to writing Python, we can actually still use these data profiles that we've got in Data Helix. Also, we wanted to have a big um, investigation into uh, the legend language that I think was presented much earlier on. Um, and so can we take legend data type specifications and then can Data Hub understand that and then start synthetically generating data to that specification and to the, the constraint language that's in legend. So that's that's a kind of a big area of research we're looking at right now, and uh, so we've got Data Hub version two coming quite soon. So um, at the moment, we only support when it comes to analysis. We need um, discrete data as well as continuous values. We can't handle data sets of continuous values only. So that's a bit of enhancement that's coming along. Got we'll the uh, multi-table support as well. So actually, you can. So you've got the classic kind of you know um, customer supplier database. You can export those as CSV files or whatever, uh, and we'll be able to. And you can supply those as like a multi-table, and we'll understand it'll understand the relationships between the different tables. You know the foreign key and primary keys. So multi-table support's coming, and we'll finish actually with the CTGAN integration as well. So CTGAN is an open source um, GAN model that generates uh, synthetic data. Um, and so we're going to bring that into Data Hub as well, kind of wrap it over and give it that same consistent way of working as you would with all the other models. <clears throat> so hopefully that's going to be in the next month, we'll be making that big PR and it'll be available. Then in we go to the version three features. So a big question is people always ask is, well, how big a data set can you generate? At the moment, we're reliant on Pandas data frame. So the question is always, well, how much memory you've got? Um, and that's how big the data set can be that you can generate. So um, there are techniques we can do to break it up into smaller parts, but really that's that's your limit. So we're looking for Spark integration. So we can actually run these as like Spark jobs on a Hadoop cluster, for example, or uh, and then um, you know, generate really, truly huge data sets over in Spark. So the integration, that's what we're looking for. We've got this other element. So I think earlier, data type predictors. So I think earlier when we saw here, when we do this analysis, you've got to pass it in the discrete continuous values. So what we'll look for is there's a, another bit of work that we've got going on where you can give it this input set and then it will go and predict what all the types are, and uh, which are discrete, which are continuous, which are PII, and then it'll automatically kind of generate these, these parameters here for you or, and present, or present them to you in a way so you just you know double check what it is, first of all. And that data predictor as well, we're looking for it to understand things like, is it a QSIP, is it an ISIN, you know, standard industry codes. And so not just that's a string, but that's a country code and that's an ISIN. Um, go back. Da, 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 da. Yeah. Um, and yes, that's the next bit. So there's a few more financial types that we need to build into this. So understanding intrinsically, we already understand things like industry codes, LEIs, and so on. But you know, do, can we start understanding things like QCIP bisons, curves, tenors, and all those other kind of general financial data types as well? And again, it'll be really interested to start seeing how we can integrate that with um, with the with the Ally project. Um, and lastly, this is probably going well into next year, but we're going to finally bite the bullet with agent-based modeling. So we can actually see if you start using uh, Data Hub for more simulation-based things, you know, around agents. So, um, yeah, Andrew, if you've got anything you want to add, I'll throw the mic over to you. Uh, no, I think you did a brilliant job there, Paul. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, sorry, lots of talking. I have to drink a lot of water now before I voice lose <laughs> my voice. So, um, Andrew and Paul, I hope you don't mind me cussing in now, um, but I yes, thought please. that it might be quite nice to throw the Q&A open to um, our attendees uh, in the audience. So, if anybody's got any questions to ask um, both Paul and Andrew, feel free to use your Q&A um, button um, that I believe is right in front of you to ask your questions. Um, but in the meantime, so each of these questions are going to be to both of you. Um, because I know Data Hub and Data Helix, you know, they're similar, but they are also different. Um, so to Andrew first, um, 
who is Data Helix actually geared towards? So who are your customers? Who should be using Data Helix? It's an excellent question. I mean, we developed firstly when we were doing a project uh, for a company that ingests uh, large, uh, basically flat files of trades and then sends those trades onto the regulator. And they basically en enrich those trades and then does, do loads of validation on those trades. Uh, and really is a regulatory reporting technology. Uh, and what we needed, we needed to generate lots of uh, fake or well, test data to, to test their data in QA environments because um, a lot of their QA and dev environments were in the cloud, uh, but obviously their QA and test environments weren't secured in the same way uh, that their um, production environments were, but also they didn't want to use any of their production data in their, their test environment. So we really designed it for testers to be able to get some uh, synthetic data up and running super quickly. Um, also for that particular project, um, they, um, they built or, or they had their own spec that their engine did to validate the trades. So we built a, uh, a, a UI that created those rules. And then we thought, well, once we've got the rules, why don't we create a synthetic data generator that uses those rules and generates data that, that, that fits them. So it's really aimed at testers or developers who don't have much time and want to generate some large volumes of test data super quickly, but don't want to end up writing a whole program uh, to do so. That's amazing. Thank you. And Paul, I don't know if um, you're able to answer the same question. Who are your customers? Because I know that this is um, a city project that you developed. And so it would be good to know who you actually developed it for. Yeah, sure. So um, this started off life uh, at City at something called E4, which is our Distinguished Engineering Program, uh, which that's where I kind of authored it. Um, so originally we were aiming it at um, the area I work in, which is client onboarding. So we had some very complicated um, client onboarding events. Also, it was a struggle to work with vendors um, a lot in this space, I, you know, particularly when it's coming down to APIs, how do we work around a particular data set we want to do? So um, that was probably our original use case that we had. And then slowly internally grew to our big areas. So creating portfolios of trades for various asset classes, um, I think there was some other elements uh, where looking at kind of payments and credit cards for some of our clients as well. So working with quite a few clients where they want, they actually some of our clients and ourselves wanted to generate synthetic data. So we started to engage with them and kind of helping them out. Um, so that was it. And then after that, it's kind of, um, yeah, I guess we're kind of looking at more and more use cases we go. So um, we have a working group um, that James, and has been running for us and I think now we're going to be so yeah if there are use cases out there I'd love to hear from them and we can always try and look what we can build into the roadmap. That's amazing and Paul um, as I ask Andrew the next question it'll be awesome if you could share your screen and actually show people the data hub and data helix repositories on github um, so we can actually show people how to get involved but whilst you're doing that um, Andrew, I'd like to ask you, are there any potential synergies across other FinOS projects for Data Hub and Data Helix? Yeah, I think Paul and I are very interested in chatting to, uh, I guess, the more fear developers and also the uh, legend developers. Uh, because from our point of view, um, if there's areas of uh, FinOS where they're looking in the modeling space where you model things, obviously that, that kind of spills over into once you have a model of the data, can you generate synthetic data from the model. Now, it turns out you probably need a little bit more information than just the model, because often the model will describe uh, the, the type of the data. So it will say it's an integer and it might have a meaning. It might say, actually, this is a writ code, uh, but it doesn't give you rules between fields and, and often complex rules that you need if you're gonna generate uh, data that looks like the data you want to generate. So I, I, there's definite synergies and we're very keen to talk to them. Uh, and then we're keen to work out actually what above that modeling do you need, such as it, do you need a, a kind of a shape of the data overlaid on the model to, to give you enough information to be able to generate realistic synthetic data. But it's definitely something that we're very keen on, on having those discussions. And I think it's a, a good yeah first port of call to, to understand how that, that could yeah, sync together. That's amazing. Thank you very much, Andrew. Um, and Paul, I can see in the background, you've been giving us a bit of a virtual tour um, of the Data Hub repository on GitHub. Would you mind uh, just giving us a bit of a voiceover and maybe taking us through the types of issues um, that you know, are within the backlog and how people can get involved um, with the team? 
Sure. So I guess um, reach out to any of us. So Andrew Carr, myself, James, there's also Ben Fielding as well from Jensen. Um, so we're all part of the kind of, I guess, this working group under Finos. Um, now, I'd probably say always the best way to evolve is just get on and raise an issue and to start a discussion. And we're really happy to get a discussion going on there. Um, you know, and then we're really what we are particularly looking for is anybody from AI, ML, data science type backgrounds who that want to, not even if you're contributing code, but we'd love to hear your ideas um, just to help us with the creative, creative thinking. So, um, you know, if people want to get in and start actually helping contribute in code, fantastic that'd be great as well um so yeah i'd say always the best way to get involved is, is raise an issue and start a discussion that's amazing and um what type of contributors are you actually looking um for within data hub and also data helix so maybe i'll ask that question to andrew first um what type of person would you like to get involved in the project uh for me both i guess architects in in the working out the synergy with the other uh components developers because we want people to use it and, and find it useful, uh, but also testers so that they can kind of keep talking about how easy they find it. Um, now I know um, certainly from our point of view, again, you know, if, if there's a way uh, of, of seeing how these synergies work, but also um, playing around, I guess, with the data helix playgrounds, you can go online, you can change your profile, you can press generate and actually see, you know, what the rules can generate. So feedback on those rules as well. And that can be from anyone. So Paul, I know that you're controlling the screen at the moment. So if you can remove issues from the URL so we can see the entry point for Data Hub, um, and then in a new tab, um, go to Data Helix, because I just want people to know that um, Data Hub and Data Helix are two separate projects. And so if you'd like to uh, find both projects on um, the Finos organization, um, the first is Data Hub, which is on Paul's first tab, and then the second is Data Helix, which is on Paul's second. And so, Tosha, um, I believe you also have a question. Um, I do. For both Andrew and Paul, feel free to, to ask them. I do. Uh, thank you, James. So I worked at, um, in a previous part of my career in electronic foreign exchange, and well, obviously there's Lots of big data sets, and um, and I'm I'm wondering if how easy it would it would be if I was still there to um, generate a data set of realistic, uh, essentially tick data um, for particular currency pairs to run it through a back tester and evaluate if our you know algorithms were were working the way they were supposed to. Is that is that a use case that um, could be met through through either of the uh, <clears throat> not not through data so i'll just talk about data helix first of all and then hand over to Paul for data hub not with data helix easily if i'm honest uh, i think the rules are such that um uh, one of the products which look at the, the the kind of shape of the data and then try and mimic it would give you much more realistic data unfortunately because data helix uses rules it doesn't have rules between the rows so if you did for example uh you know something that was ticking uh, it would jump all over the place it would be 35 one second and then 102 the next second. So it wouldn't be realistic enough. Now, uh, certainly Paul and I have discussed kind of, you know, how, how you get something to do the correct shape of the data. And I think the tool you would need to do that would need to mimic the correct shape of the data such that the price wouldn't just jump all over the place. It would slowly go up or, you know, it would go up. If it was going up quickly, it would still go up in steps. It wouldn't just jump up, jump down, jump up, jump down, jump down. So. For, for the moment, Data Helix would be a no, but you know, looking forward, I think with Data Helix and Data Hub looking to to come together, I think you could end up with yeah enough components, including the Data Helix, to be able to do that. But yeah, I think Paul has to talk about the Data Data Hub. Yeah. So for us, um, when you, I think I showed earlier how you can write your own uh, extensions. So I don't do it quite now but it's actually quite easy to write your own extension function. So really, I guess if you're looking at time series data is the, 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 val the last couple of values you've generated are an input to the next value you're gonna generate. So um, if you do it very simply, basically pick a, have a number, pick a random number between one or 2% from that number, maybe that, from the previous number, if that makes sense. Maybe you want, that maybe you wanna out, 
generate something like that. So you can do, we can do that with your own, with an own extension function. I don't handle the analysis yet. There is a library. There is some Python work that's been done by some people out of Cornell University that does do analysis of time series data, and then again through GANs again. So I am actually kind of looking at how that could be integrated in Data Hub as well. So, um, and if there are things mature enough yet to, be, to 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 use it. So, the answer is kind of a kind of you can. <laughs> that is fair enough. Fair enough. Thank you. Um, I have a another one back from my FX days. I, I, there were we you know we had electronic trading happening in multiple different areas across the firm and some of that information you couldn't um so actually on trade data not real time um you know ticking data but trades that were executed um we'd want to know about them but because of data privacy laws you can't pass that between that information between jurisdictions so is that a use case where i could essentially now, as you were talking about earlier, and um, and this is not an area of expertise, but um, I'm guessing differential privacy plays into it. Is that a, a where a, a use case where I could pass the data over from one region to another, knowing that I have safely um, not passed any client information or specific regional information that wasn't allowed to be shared? Got it. So I think that's more a problem that would be lend towards redaction and anonymization, because what you, what you don't want to do Yes. with that you want to you want to straight remove it yeah otherwise we'll be making up the trades and it'll be a bit scary <laughs> to sorry well theoretically the shape of all the if you did like generated ten thousand trades hopefully they'll be statistically the same but um couldn't quite guarantee that <laughs> so paul and andrew i saw stephen goldbump from morfer actually came on cam to ask you a question so stephen are you there yeah, yeah. So one of the things that we've been interested in more for is the idea of in domain modeling that you want to sit down with your business owners and kind of come up with a model in real time together. Uh, and part of that would be generating sample test data. So as you're coding, you know, imagine like a, a, a decision table, it's got a finite set of, of values. And it would be great that as you're coding and adding that finite set of values in an enum or something like that, that you can generate the sample data on the side and that can run and your users can see that in real time and see that, oh yeah, the, the rules that we're coding right now actually pass those tests. Is that something that you would see would be uh, doable? Um, you can definitely do that with the data helix now with the playground, online playground. I mean, it's depending on how complex the rules are, will determine how quickly it responds. But you can do that. You can, you can, and I didn't do a live demo just because I'm scared of doing live demos and things always go wrong when you try them live. But um, you can just edit the rules in the web browser, press run, and it will regenerate the data. And I totally agree with you, Stephen. I think ultimately, certainly with users, when they see the data, in reality, that's when they go, oh, no, no, that's not right. That can't be that because of that. And that's when you get really useful information that they just happen to have forgotten to tell you. That when you go and code it and come back, then they go, no, no, not like that. That you, Yeah, if it's interactive, you, you totally get that response. Yeah, cool. Thanks. So that's great. And so before I ask the next question, I just want to remind um, people in the audience that you can actually ask your own questions by using the Q&A um, facility that's in front of you on screen. Um, but in the meantime, so Andrew, I understand Data Helix is actually written in Java. And Paul, we know that um, Data Hub is actually written in Python. Um, as you've been exploring the synergies between both projects, can you kind of talk about the ideas um, that you've been having for bringing both projects closer together in terms of functionality? So I, I guess for me, I think Paul and I have been talking about three things in terms of synergy. One is architecture, two is API points, and three is language. I think um, the Data Helix was originally written in Java, I guess for a couple of reasons. One, because of the project it was involved with to start with. Two, because uh, the, the resources I use were all Java developers. I had them available. It kind of made sense. And, and three at the time, um, quite a few of the organizations we thought would use it, we know were heavy Java users. Looking back now, though, I probably would have done it in Python. So I think the, the move forward is uh, to sync up with the Data Hub and really move any Data Helix components we want to keep 
uh, into into the Python, so that yeah, so that the data Helix and Data Hub become components in this, you know, the Finos synthetic data components, I guess. And um, Paul, yeah. is that um, something that you agree with? Hello. Okay. I hope, so, he, I oh, hope wait, he agrees wait. with it because we're moving all the yes. components over. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sorry. Uh, okay. uh, no, I, I'm on like, sorry, I, I muted myself and uh, actually I, I muted myself to talk. I didn't realize I was on mute already. <laughs> I'm muted already. So um, yeah, no, it's obviously something I completely agree with. And I think one of the benefits of Python in this space is just the, the weight of that data science community that's behind it. Um, it's by far clear the, the winning language. Um, and I think also within most financial firms now, most of us are using Python to glue quant libraries and all sorts of things together. So it's just a, uh, I think in that space, it's just a clear winner. Uh, mainly because I think also with Python, it's if you could, particularly I found in the synthetic space, every time I go, oh, I'm going to code this thing together, a quick Google search found so that somebody's already built it and I can just hit install it and then expose it, you know, make a few modifications around the top of it and expose it through Data Hub. That's brilliant. And um, I'd like to remind everybody, you know, who's actually watching us speak that um, both Data Hub and Data Helix are open source projects. And so they're here for people to utilize now. Um, so Paul, without putting you too much on the spot, can you just introduce, you know, the readme's and, you know, how people can actually fork and clone and, you know, bring uh, the projects local to, um, to test before they get involved, you know, with the community? Sure, I guess so. Okay, so the most simple way is uh, to get you started with Data Hub is, um, let's just do this quickly. And um, I'm just going to generate a Python virtual environment, Python, uh, Python minus M. No worries. So we can PM. see M. Chrome at the moment. Uh, well, hopefully. That's interesting that you can see Chrome. Uh, oh, apologies. Let me stop that share. Um, and start the share again. And share the screen. That's it. I can there see. There we go. <laughs> Excellent. So um, let's just activate that. So getting started data is is simply as simple as hit install data. I can't type today. Data core. Enter, and you can see it's bringing it down. And off you go. So if you want to start with it, that's what you can do. And then all you need to do is go into one of our test folder, folders, test, pick a test, cut and paste that in, um, put it into a Python file, and then just run it, and it will work. So that's if you want to run your own. Um, otherwise, again, the easiest way to normally start with stuff is um, let me maybe start another window up. Uh, where am I? Uh, Finos Data Hub. So if you were to clone this again, is again, start with your virtual environment and just run PyTest. Um, and that'll run all the tests and show you that it's all working. So just explore all those test examples that are there. Um, and this is actually my my dev machine. So that's a broken. <laughs> so of course it's not going to work because I left. Uh, yeah, it's lucky I didn't start from there. Uh, but there you go. Good example. The tests are broken. Um, only so, broken. But, but that's fine. And so the um, both the Data Hub and Data Helix community is very welcoming for people to uh, clean the repositories, bring them down locally, <coughs> install the virtual environments, and run tests to get it up and running. And then also if they find um, issues um, to feed that back into your, um, into the GitHub issues for the project and get involved with the community. Exactly. And so, I'm... and that's brilliant. And so as we lead into the um, final two minutes um, of our session this afternoon, um, so Paul and Andrew, do you have any kind of um, final asks, you know, for people who are actually watching us this afternoon? Is there anything that you would like people to get involved with where you need help? Um, just so, you know, we've got, um, I don't know, an entry point for anybody who wants to get involved. 
Yes. Uh, Andrew, do you want to take that one? If not, I can. I shall take that then. So I think um, some good areas that we're really interested in. So there's certainly that that link up with um, Legend. Morphea also sounds really interesting. I know we've got a couple of people on from there. So again, you know, what synergies are there for that area? Um, I'd really like to know kind of any missing functionality. So real, real primitives that might be missing for somebody, you know, if there's anything there. Um, another thing that's going on is creating a set of examples based on the uh, ISDA and CDM specs. So that was a thing that also uh, we engaged with in early in the year. So could there just be a whole load of examples of like, this is how you make a, this type of ISDA contract or that type of ISDA contract. And there's just a little bit of Python script there that you can just cut and paste and, off you go you can start synthetically generating that that is the object so again that's that's a really nice easy area to get involved in as well so anybody with is their understanding fantastic um yeah um try to think of some of the other areas andrew have you got some areas uh no i think you've covered it all for actually i think yeah just feedback if anyone's got any use cases like paul says uh, the more use cases we do the more we kind of get to have experience on you know what would work well with the projects and what you know how the projects need to uh, change and evolve to to hit new use cases yeah so um, that's i was just going to say that's it's been an amazing um past hour of being um escorted through data hub and data helix thank you very much andrew carr and um paul graves um for taking us through both of your projects and with that, I'd like to hand the group back over to Tosha Ellison, who's going to introduce the next section for us. Great. Yeah, thank you, thank James. You. Uh, thank you very much for that. Um, so in our final session, I'm, I'm, um, I'm pleased to have a presentation on perspective, which was one of the earlier contributions that came from JP Morgan uh, into the foundation. And so we've really had an opportunity to um, you know, see it develop and, and see the, the community grow, uh, which is which is always nice. And it's, it's certainly something that um, is a, an area that I'm interested in just from my personal background and, and um, you know, which has broad applicability ac across industries is, is how you present complex, fast moving data um, in ways that's easy to interpret. And how do you give access to your, you know, your users to be able to, to make sense of that data too. And, and of course that ties into some of the conversations in the, in the previous one. So um, with that, uh, I'm, I'm pleased to share this presentation from June Tan uh, in the perspective team. I will stop my video. Uh, there we go. Hi, everyone. Thank you for virtually attending. My name is Jun Yuan Tan. I go by June. I'm a software engineer at JP Morgan. And for the past two and a half years, I've been part of the team working on Perspective, an open source streaming data visualization engine that's built for large streaming data sets. And uh, being a Finno subconference, I figured that there are people in the audience who've already used Perspective. You might have heard of it. You might have used it a little bit. You might have even contributed to it, for example. And so for this presentation, I wanted to talk about something that's pretty new in terms of our project. We've been working on it for a little over a year now, and it's taking perspective out of the WebAssembly context and porting it to Python, and more specifically using the using perspective Python within JupyterLab to do streaming data visualization in a whole new domain in a whole new way. So I wanted to start off by talking about the sort of two predominant ways that you can do streaming data visualizations and interactive visualizations, which is a web dashboard and in JupyterLab or using Python. So web dashboards are great. They are interactive. They're easy to use. You can have really visually beautiful visualizations, arbitrarily complex UIs. But at the same time, not everybody wants to write JavaScript and not everybody can. Python in data science is really the de facto language, the de facto standard. And it's difficult to have somebody you know, have to learn Python and do JavaScript and sort of do the UI part and the data part at the same time. But when we look at JupyterLab, for example, it's extremely powerful. It's Python is the de facto standard. JupyterLab is the standard. 
uh, but at the same time, it has the sort of drawbacks that web graphics and sort of uh, web dashboards really excel at, which is that it's more difficult to write UIs in IPy widgets. And as a data scientist, as a developer, you might not want to spend all of your time doing custom UIs for each individual notebook or even, you know, kind of hand rolling your own UI library to do these sort of visualizations and transformations. So Perspective in JupyterLab really kind of takes the strengths of those platforms and provides something that's that's not only easy to use, not only interactive, not only, you know, intuitive and has really a lot of power just in doing the sort of analysis and visualization, but it allows you to do it on top of the power, the compute power, the threading, the parallelism of Python, as well as the extensibility of Python. As long as you give Perspective some data, it, you know, it can visualize it, it can pivot it, it can transform it. And you can use Python to create arbitrarily complex data sets, arbitrarily complex data sources. And as long as you give Perspective some data, it'll work. And you, you get the UI part, you get the dashboard part almost for free in, in JupyterLab. So um, very quickly, uh, for people who aren't familiar, Perspective is an interactive visualization engine for large streaming data sets. It was built at JP Morgan for the trading business. It's still used at JP Morgan and by developers, institutions um, around the world. It's open source. It was open sourced in uh, at the end of 2017, and now it exists as part of a Finos project. And it allows you to not only transform data in the browser and um, in in the engine. So it allows you to apply pivots, filters, aggregate sorts, um, computations using a really high performance C++ core engine. Um, that's compiled to WebAssembly. It also allows you to visualize data. We have a custom data grid and we have a D3FC based um, data visualization package, which D3FC is built by ScottLogic, who um, I know someone from ScottLogic is speaking at this conference. I'm sure there are ScottLogic attendees and it's a really great visualization product that we're you know, extremely happy to use and very happy to have people from ScottLogic contribute to Perspective. And it runs in the browser initially, but now we've ported it to Python as a standalone runtime and uh, in specifically in JupyterLab. So to kind of look at this, um, uh, how to do streaming visualization in JupyterLab with perspective, we're going to take a very common scenario. We're going to take a fictional portfolio of stocks, uh, a basket, and we're going to visualize it and we're going to analyze it. And we want to do two things. We want to do real-time analysis. We want to have streaming data that comes in. And we want to do we want to do uh, pivots. We want to do aggregations, etc., in real time. But we also want larger data sets of historical data, and we want to look at that and you know do it in the same sort of context. Do it within Jupyter Lab. Um, we don't want to have to write different data sources. We don't have to do different fetch APIs, for example, in a web dashboard or connect it to different data sources um, using a web framework. We we just want to do it all within Jupyter Lab, and most importantly, we want to do as minimal transformation in code as possible. So there is data cleaning, there is sort of getting the data into the right format for perspective, but we don't want to do more calculations in the data. We don't want to um, have custom calculations on a data frame, for example, or on a JSON object. We actually just want to take the data, pass it to perspective, and have perspective do all the heavy lifting. And you'll see that it's actually really quite easy and very intuitive to have that sort of framework. So I'm going to start off by doing a very quick rundown of the perspective basics, um, the API. Um, if you look at the browser versions, if you've used the browser version, the UI is exactly the same. Um, the API in Python is pretty much the same as the browser version, and we've designed it so that the two are completely cross-compatible. So I'll start by just importing and creating a table. So obviously, this being um, Python and Jupyter, you can now give um, pandas data frames to perspective. We handle that very quickly. And um, you can either create a table, the sort of base container for data um, from a data set, so from this data frame here, or you can create it from a schema, which is just a mapping of column names to column types. And with the schema, we're going to create a table that has an index. And this is important later on because we're going to be creating with various data sources, we're going to be creating a unidirectional data flow where the data comes from one source, the IEX Cloud API that we're going to be using to get our streaming and static data, and it flows through a series of perspective tables, almost like a graph, if you if you will, um, to actually create to store data, to manipulate data, to allow you to do all sorts of different analysis, kind of all based on this one data flow. So if we get started, we create this table and we can create a view, which is a query on the view. 
on on the table, excuse me. So uh, in a SQL analogy, it's kind of like a table is a SQL table and a view is a continuous query where you can update the underlying table as many times as you want, but you never have to recreate the view. The query can stand on its own and it gets notified of new data coming from the table and you you can always re-serialize the view out into whatever format you'd like and it will always be up to date. So we'll create again a unindex table and an index table, which has a primary key, and we're gonna update it. So if we update the unindex table and we create a view and we query it, we'll see that it's sorted here from 2,500 all the way down. And if we update it again, but we don't recreate the view, we just requery it, you'll see that we actually get the most up-to-date data. So we've got 2,500 and 1,500, and this was created a couple of seconds later. Um, and it appends on a uh, unindex table, but on an index table, it will actually um, update based on primary key. So if I do an update here, you'll see that it overwrote some of the rows and appended some rows and it left some untouched. And this is again really important because we're going to be using primary keys and indexes to um, store some of our data in certain ways where we only want to store one row with a given primary key. But in another table, we want to store every single row that comes in, regardless of primary key. So for example, in this scenario, we, we want one table that has um, the, the latest price for every single stock. We want one table with every single price change for every single stock. And that's where the index really comes in. And we're going to do this sort of linking, like I've talked about, using onUpdate, which is just a callback that runs every time the table updates. And this is kind of where the sort of um, joining comes in, the, the joining data sources. We have a table that um, has an onUpdate callback. We set it on the view. And the callback runs, and it takes the rows that updated, and it passes it to, the, to a different table, right? So it passes it to the index table. So now, if I update the unindex table, and I query the index table, you'll see that it actually updated the index table with all this new data, but it also looked at the primary keys in order to apply it properly. So if I were to actually look at table.view2df, you'll see that I've got all this data, right? And because it's unindexed, it appended all of it at the end. But within the index table, we have it um, updating based on the primary key. So this is really important. We'll, we'll get to it in a second. Um, you can serialize your data from a view, so you can do uh, to data frame, to a CSV, to, um, to JSON, and that's all great, but the most important thing is actually you can um, serialize your data to Arrow. So Perspective integrates this Apache Arrow extremely, um, extremely well. We um, load Apache Arrows um, with almost a zero cost uh, load by copying the underlying memory into Perspective. So loading Apache Arrows is... Um, 50 to 100 times faster than it, than loading a regular data frame. Um, but we also allow you to write data out to Arrow, and we allow you to pass these arrows back and forth. And again, it's it's a really easy way to work with Apache Arrows, which is you know a, a super um, high high performance uh, binary data format. But being a binary data format means that you you really ha you have to use their library to to parse it, to do to write it, to do different things. And Perspective offers a visualization, a transformation layer that's extremely intuitive on top of Apache Arrow. So if we save the to Arrow, we can save it to the file system. If I load it, you'll see I've got example.arrow. And if I res if I if I load it from the file system, you'll see that this is all the data that we just had. And we can sort it. We can do um, whatever, you know, anything we'd like on it, we can group it, we can um, filter it, for example, we can um, do, as, do, do as much analysis as we like. And this is kind of the, the, the meat of um, what we're going to be talking about, which is using Perspective Widget and using the Perspective UI, but within JupyterLab. So you'll see that um, here we're going to create a Perspective Widget. It's the exact same UI that you're used to on the browser. Um, it has all of the same features as the UI on the browser. It's completely cross-compatible. Um, it allows you to not only um, not only not only interact with it on a UI level. So I can take away a pivot. I can add a pivot. I can add a filter. Maybe I want it to be 2.5, or maybe I wanted to sort it by B, or get rid of the sort, or add another pivot, or 
I guess D is null in this case, so I guess we can pivot here. But it also allows you to interact with it from the Jupyter kernel. So if I typed in widget row pivots, see that's me, you'll see that I can, I guess, C. And if I typed in widget row pivots equals none, it unpivoted everything. If I type in widget reset, it'll reset the entire widget, except I guess not that one for some reason. Um, but you can transform the state from uh, from Jupiter, but it also means that you actually can save the state um, within a within a library. So you could very easily, for example, instead of just initializing the widget, you could you could have these options. You could set them as you wish. Um, column pivots, right? Or you can do it later on the fact. So again, it's a, it's a whole different way to interact with um, perspective instead of having to sort of save your um, save your interactions or the, the state of your interactions, for example, in, in, a, in a way that might be cumbersome in the browser, doing it in uh, Jupyter, doing it in Python is extremely easy. And we can also do streaming data in, um, in perspective in Jupyter. So obviously streaming data is a, a big point here, um, but the issue with doing it in Python or doing it in Jupyter is that we, we can't block the main thread. We can't let the notebook be blocked while we're writing this new data, while we're rendering this new data. So we're going to use hardware threads um, on Python, and we're just going to create a new thread. We're going to run perspective in a separate thread, and we're going to have it update the UI as it goes. So if we create this widget, right now it's completely empty, and if I start this thread, you'll see that it's actually running on the separate thread as we go along. And I can do any sort of um, analysis I'd like. So I can sort it, I can pivot it again, I can pivot it again, I can do all these different things with it. And I can also, while this is running, I can use the kernel. I can still continue to use the kernel as much as I'd like, you know? I can check the size, I can um, create a new view. Let's see, so if I did row pivots equals what's a good column name and I did two JSON um, and row a hundred so it's querying it and because it's multi-threaded it's it's um, you know dispatching those um, it was in a way that's not gonna block the main browser thread and, and not the main browser thread excuse me the main kernel thread which is really important and so from that sort of overview perspective, now we can look at very quickly the data sources that I wrote, um, which use the IEX Cloud API to give us streaming market data and also uh, static market data. And it's all um, dummy data. It's really easy to get a sandbox URL <clears throat> and to get a sandbox key. So we're going to be using that. But again, the most important thing with these data sources is that they don't block the main thread. And again, we're going to use multiprocessing, we're going to use threading, and um, we're just going to hook them up together. Um, all of this code is available online. All of it's open source. So definitely feel free to take a look at it. Um, you know, play with it, play around with it as much as you want. And so we're going to get onto the sort of main part of this presentation. And um, we're going to start by doing our imports again and importing our schemas and our data sources and creating a PyX client. And PyX is the IEX wrapper library in Python. Um, and it's really easy to use, um, really simple to set up, and gets us our data um, really quickly. So we're going to use that. It's, it's great. It's a great library. And we're going to create a portfolio of stocks, just some uh, random stocks here, tech stocks, um, really no particular reason, random, randomly generated. It's all dummy data. And we're going to start by uh, setting up our data sources. So like I said earlier, we're going to create a few tables, and we're going to link them up properly to... Um, create this data flow. So we're going to start by creating a table around what stocks we have right now, a holdings table. And we're going to want to index it because we just want to know, right, as new prices come in, if the prices all append, we're going to have to do some pivots. But if we, didn't, we, we don't care about that information really in this table, so we're just going to store it with an index, which means that we're always going to get the last most recent price and most recent value for our portfolio. And... So we're going to update it here, and then we're going to create an unindex table, which is going to store all of the price changes for all of the stocks in our portfolio, which, excuse me, um, is going to be important because we obviously want to know how it changes over time. And so we're going to create that, and we're going to hook it up with on update, like I, I talked about earlier. When the, when the index table updates, 
it'll take the row and it'll push it to the unindex table, which is basically just a, a, a dump for all of the data that's come in so far. And I have also a very interesting um, architecture diagram that I cooked earlier, um, and we can look at it here. So the architecture diagram is basically, we have the IEX Cloud API, and it's all one way. So the data stream comes into quotes table, which we're going to be creating in a second. When the quotes table updates, we're going to update the holdings table. When the holdings table updates, again, that's the index table, we're going to update the unindex table. And from the unindex table, we now have all of the data that we, we've, we've been getting, and we can dump it to disk using Apache Arrow, which allows us to stream it, allows us to store it, allows us to pass it over a network boundary, to pass it to a different notebook, to send it to somebody using perspective, to host a server using perspective on that data. Um, really, the, there's a lot of possibilities. So if we create these tables, we can now create a widget. And so we configure this widget. And most importantly, we configure this widget with a computed column called value, right? Which is a column on the, on the table on the widget that actually calculates the value of the portfolio by multiplying quantity and price. So this kind of goes back to the requirement we had earlier where we don't want to have to touch code as you know much as possible. We're not doing this calculation in Python, where, or at least in user-facing Python. The user doesn't have to write a code that transforms the data before it goes into perspective. They can do it completely within perspective. And in fact, they can do it from within perspective using the... Um, using the expressions API, which again is actually um, something new that we've, we've built this year, which allows you to write these arbitrarily complex expressions that will, um, that will update as your table updates and it will um, resolve itself properly. So if I were to do, let's see if I deleted that and I did the square root of value, for example, and I push it out, it will actually give you all of these columns. And you'll see when we start updating the table, these columns will update um, at the same time in, in real time, basically. So now we can create a, another widget for our total table. This is going to be configured as a uh, line chart that's just going to look at all the prices as they tick in. So again, looking at the sort of data flow, what we've set up so far is we've set up these two tables, and these are going to be our holdings. And now we can set up um, a quotes table, which is the table that's actually going to be taking data from the IEX API. So again, using on update, when the quotes table updates, we're going to we're gonna um, send the data to the holdings table. And when the holdings table updates, we're going to send the data to the total table, and so on. So we can create two more widgets here. One of them is just going to be a, 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 a grid, for, sorry, um, just showing us the latest prices. And the other one is going to be a chart showing us the latest prices coming in. And um, we can start the data source. So we can do a little bit of cleaning. The sandbox data doesn't have the right date time set. And so we want to have it sort of look live in this case. Um, they're randomly generated date time. So here we're going to actually just have um, date time now as a sort of proxy. And we're going to start this uh, data source. So now you'll see this data is coming in live right now, right? Um, it's updating here. It's updating on our uh, quotes table, these two actually being fed from the same table. It's updating the value of our portfolio over here. So this is the value of our portfolio right now over time as it you know increases or decreases. Um, because it's dummy data, it'll probably stay pretty still, but um, you'll get the point. And here is our um, columns. I think I need to change this to uh, not no. And now it'll update. Um, Zoom is at zero for some reason. I think that might be a data issue. But you'll see that as our prices update on this index table, it all of the computed columns are updating at the same time, just in lockstep, right? And again, going back to one of our original requirements, the main browser, the main um, kernel thread, my bad, is, is never blocked. I can do as much you know queries on this as I'd like. I can do quotes table size, for example. Ah, quotes, uh, excuse me. And I can see it continue to tick. Um, I can, again, do the same thing. I can get another view out of it. Um, let's do to dict and row or start row 100 and row 150, and that's 50 rows in a dictionary out. And I'm going to clear that output just so we don't have to look at it. And we can also do other things, like we can take this 
um, we can take this output, we can put it in a separate view, we can have it over here. So now we can look at our um, data as it is ticking live. That might, again, be sort of dummy fluctuation. Um, and we can also do, we can also create more computed columns. So for example, if we didn't care about the data ticking in every, um, every second or every subsecond, we can have it actually look at it per minute, for example. So if we bucket by time, and we change the pivots here, we can see that now everything is being aggregated by the total value um, over time. And I think this might be wrong. There we go. Yeah, so it was because it was doing a minute, it was adding together the value at every second. So we changed that to last, which is the, the basically the last value in the table um, for that minute. And this will give us the correct value for our portfolio. So you can see, and we can also get rid of the split. So now this is just the, I think this might be a sum and we might just have to repivot it, but you can kind of see the point of, it allows you to do, you know, as much analysis as you'd like on, on in Jupyter Lab. And you have the UI, it's given to you for free. You have the ability to do complex visualizations and you also have the ability to do um, static visualizations at the same time. It's just as powerful. We can backtest um, using historical prices. So a little bit more cleaning here, and we're gonna get the data for the past five years. And we can create another um, another widget here, and we can render everything. And now we can see this is, <clears throat> excuse me, the open high, uh, open high, low close for um, the S&P 500 index uh, ETF. And again, if I didn't wanna look at it every single day, I could, maybe look at it by month bucket actually i think yeah month bucket um date and if i were to bucket it here you can see the actual uh, open high low close for each month and i can take that i can pivot it out by symbol now i can see it on all symbols i can also again filter it down to something more specific so if we can look at SPY, we can also look at SNAP in this case. Again, completely different charts. Um, and then if we wanted to look at it on a more granular level, again, we can just take off that pivot. We can add this pivot back in. And now we've got an extremely granular view of per day on the open high low close prices, right? But again, all of this is extremely easy to do using perspective, using um, the UI that's already been provided. It allows you to hook up a complex data set from uh, Python, from a Python kernel. And it allows you to do it with very minimal transformations um, within the code by the end user. So imagine uh, a, an end user who's looking at a notebook or a voila app, or if you're preparing a report using a notebook, for example, you can give them the notebook. And instead of kind of looking at pre-generated charts or having to dig into the notebook to regenerate your charts, you just show them perspective and they can do all of the transformations, do everything interactively um, within the UI. And one of the other really cool features that I wanted to talk about was this sort of integration with Apache Arrow. Um, if we create a view here that just has the value, we don't care about the price, but we're calculating the value and we save it on another thread. We've just saved uh, everything to the, uh, to the file system and we can open it up. And again, there's uh, quite a lot of power to this, right? We can do exactly the same analysis that we did earlier. So. Well, maybe not like that, but we can do it here and split it by time. And now we suddenly have all of the prices that, you know, we've been looking at, except in a, in a static form, obviously. Um, so it's not updating live, but you can see the sort of power in this where if you wanted to, for example, build a notebook that, <clears throat> excuse me, ran live analytics over a day. And at the end of the day, you saved it to disk and you ran it for 20 days and you wanted to look at every single day of analysis, you don't have to go to the web API or whatever data source you're fetching it from and try to reconcile everything or try to um, maintain a separate database. You just store 20 arrows and you load them in a row and you can put them in the same widget, you can put them in the same perspective widget and there you go. You can have it, um, you can host a web server, you can run a remote perspective using um, <clears throat> perspective Python and perspective in the browser. There are a lot of possibilities. And so one of the things you can do here really simply is we're gonna restart it just to make sure, um, open it in a separate uh, notebook. So now again, we have all the same data again. You can do all the same pivots. You can do everything um, in the same way. 
Or you can actually open a perspective workspace that's running on a perspective service. It's getting data from a perspective server. And actually this whole time I've been running a server that is in the background that's using perspective Python and it's actually going to have, I think the render thread might be blocked, um, but it will be, there we go. So if I update all the points, you'll see that it's been running um, for about 40 minutes now. And it's still getting as far as I can tell, it should still be getting live data. And if we were to, for example, um, bucket this by minute, you'll see that we have each minute here. And so this really brings together again, um, the sort of paradigms of a web dashboard and a Python backend, um, but it's more powerful than what you can do maybe in Jupyter Lab. But there is a little more setup with a web server and you have to deploy it or you have to run it somewhere, but it allows you to create even more interactive dashboards that you know are, are fed by Python, um, all the state is synchronized. It's extremely powerful in that you can, you know, um, so if I used last, there we go. Um, it's extremely powerful. You can, you know, have all of the power of uh, perspective workspace. You can have this, for example, be a global filter. You can click on it to filter on the rest of the dashboard. You can package this dashboard. You can deploy it at an endpoint. You can send it to somebody. Um, you can dump the data out of here into a CSV, et cetera. All of this, it's it's all, you know, there's a lot of possibilities there. And so I think this really brings uh, my presentation to a close. Um, I wanted to thank you all for attending. I wanted to thank the organizers, um, both at the Linux Foundation and at Finos for uh, bringing, putting this event together and for uh, inviting me. Um, everything that I've talked about is open source. Every, every single part of the code that you saw is open source. Perspective is fully open source. Um, the notebooks. Um, everything on this presentation is online. So feel free to take a look at it. Feel free to reach out to me or on the perspective repo or with any questions or any ideas. And thank you guys for attending. Um, thank you so much, June. That was, um, that was fantastic. Uh, you've already answered um, <laughs> One question um, online, maybe uh, in case anybody missed that, do you want to just touch on um, touch on that question and answer? Uh, hi, I, I don't know. Can you can see me? Okay, awesome. Yeah, yeah. Hi. perfect. Um, Thank you. Yeah, I so the question from let me read it out again from uh, Adam Jones was about whether we can create recordings that can be rerun or view it at a later date. And I'm not exactly sure what recording means in, in this sort of context. Um, in JupyterLab, like the notebook state is always persistent. So um, as long as the kernel is alive, it'll be there. With with the perspective viewer, uh, with the widget, actually, the way we've implemented it is that the, um, the, the viewer state will be persistent even after the kernel is dead. So the Python kernel could be you know, crashed or stopped or whatever, but because Perspective is a, a WASM-based, you know, engine, and we we're actually able to run the exact same data set in WASM at the same time as the Python kernel. So you, you're able to basically see your state, you're able to do any more transformations, whatever you'd like within the UI, um, you know, long after the kernel is dead. Um, and you can also serialize your data out to different formats. You can save the config of your widget. Um, and it's kind of, part of that's enabled by the platform of Jupyter Lab and this sort of notebook architecture. And part of that is um, the way that we've implemented Perspective Widget. And I, I don't know if that fully answers the question, but um, that was my take on what kind of recording meant in this in this case. So. Thank you. And, and Adam, we can um, always put you in touch with June afterwards if you'd like to carry on the conversation. But he says, yes, that does. So, um, so thank you. Um, if there are there, I know we're we're just we're, we're a little bit over time. So, um, are there any other questions before we wrap up? No. Great, well, um, June and and everyone else. Thank you so much for um, for joining us. And as everybody has reiterated, this is all open. Go check out the repos. Figure out how to get involved. Um, you've you've heard from our our 
you know, project leaders that, that everybody is friendly and, you know, and, and really welcomes contributions. So please do um, take the opportunity to, um, to join our community. And um, with that, I will thank you all very much for attending. Thank mm -hmm. you.